Well, welcome everyone. Um, Daniel Black, if you don't know me. Uh, today we're going to be covering the Database Micro Conference. Uh, I've got you know, a number of great uh, discussion leaders here to present on the topics below that you have undoubtedly seen on the calendar, so I'll get right into it. I'm going to try to run today's session under like a De Bono's kind of blue hat, um, six hat theory to actually lead the discussion um, as much as possible in most directions before coming to a conclusion because, you know, the first idea that we come up with isn't always the best one and it's not always the worst. So um, we're going to try to do that. So on the blue hack side of the intro, um, I'm going to reaffirm that this is a discussion as um, you've seen done particularly well in some of the talks uh, so far. Um, but here so particularly well. Um, some of the other talk uh, discussions you may have known have led to a particularly um, solution orientated thing. Um, I think uh, by talking to our speakers here that they're more to here to actually pr present the problems rather than a particular solution in a way. Um, Uh, under the white hat today, uh, we're going to be covering the six uh, thinking hats. So we've got a blue hat to cover the management side. Uh, the white hat, um, as I mentioned before, leads into factual information um, that, that we know about the problem. A green hat sort of leads to the development of opportunities and um, potential solutions. Um, Red Hat, just to get a, a gauge of our feelings on the solutions or the problem statement or the general process as it is. Um, a Yellow Hat to sort of encompass the optimism around particular solutions. Uh, Black Hat to look at the, the caution aspects of it. And yeah, we'll probably end up with a Blue Hat at the end to sort of um, cue in the discussion on that. Um, I will be sort of timing things and sort of keeping things going. Um, but is there any other questions for now before we start? Nope. Excellent. Um, Dimitri, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, so it seems like I will sp speak a lot here. So I at least uh, uh, tell you what we are doing. So well, be before to start soon. So I'm uh, in uh, MySQL. Uh, performance team. So, well, I was working in Benchmark Center at Sun before, and uh, when Sun acquired uh, MySQL, Oracle acquired Sun. So, MySQL now is at Oracle. And, well, I was doing performance stuff for fun around MySQL, but uh, <coughs> finally they proposed me to do it full stuff. So, it's really exciting. And the most exciting is we have so many problems on we wanted to expose it here and expecting them uh, with common effort, we can bring something more here. So uh, the first topic uh, which we wanted to discuss, so this is totally opposite to all other micro conference when people presenting solution, you see we are presenting problems. <laughs> so I really hope you got your good breakfast and wake it up. So. The first point is about uh, are you during? In fact, 
in MySQL, so InnoDB using asynchronous I.O. from a long time. It was given even uh, using internal uh, homemade asynchronous I.O. So uh, since version 5.5, we moved to the native asynchronous I.O. And now there is a lot of excitement about uh, uh, I.O. Ruin library. So people are reporting some very nice results, uh, nice observations, but it's still pure I.O. testing. With, and historically, we know that uh, there were so many storage vendors showing them they have excellent results on uh, pure I.O. test. When we run MySQL on this, it's just twice lower than what we already have. So we are very uh, sens sensible here, and developers are critical on this. So from a long time, for example, there was a pressure on us, why we don't use POSIX mute access, why we don't use Stardent libraries. We made a fork, we made a uh, general layer, then you can use any kind of lock uh, primitive today in MySQL, and it's always given worse results than what we have in homemade implementation. So for this case, uh, you know, to motivate developers, I need to have uh, some good examples, strong feedback about, so is it stable enough for this library? So any feedback you have, is it uh, really better than uh, default I.O. in all cases? What kind of problem you have, you see already? So well, what, what, what shall we do? So, yeah, so yeah, I think now's a good time for anyone who's um, started to use I.O. Uring to sort of to explain what they've seen. So, hey. and can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, we have, I've started to work on a fork of, or on a patch set for Postgres that uses I.O. Uring, and the results are pretty decent, not great yet, the CPU usage for IO Uring is still much, much higher than if you do it uh, for, all, for current normal writes or for o direct or direct. I think I've started to mail with Jens Expo uh, to fix some of those issues and it seems like so that's mostly fixable and based on my very prototype code, you can expect pretty decent wins from using it, especially because you can with a recent syscall, it's getting much more expensive due to the whole security fixes, uh, being able to have only one syscall and like a lot of writes in my benchmarks is quite valuable. Yeah, but also you mentioned mm -hmm. it then. Yeah, that's, that's the point. So, well, if you submit it with like the polling set, then it is. If I recall, you, you mentioned it then. Can I ask for a quick clarification? You said more CPU no, for, for not or using O direct. The CPU usage is higher because all the writes go through the work queue, and the work queue then spawns like, I don't know, six, like two time CPUs uh, uh, workers, and they all contend on the inode lock. So you, all you get is a lot more contention on inode lock, right. and that makes things slower. And I think Jens was suggesting we just reduce the number, uh, have a separate work queue for writers, and then that problem gets solved by having less concurrency, which is obviously not the best approach, but like I think it will, for now, be better. It would obviously be better if writes could work with the, whatever the uh, no weight flag thing, and then could actually be much fa faster, but that seems like a bit further off. Right, and so the reason why I asked for the clarification was like, in general, AIO in the kernel is split up between direct IO and buffered, and one works very well, and one is kind of a best effort. We hope it works for you. Uh, um, so Depending the, on who you ask, the, yeah, the answer which is which <laughs> would be different. <laughs> um, but so hopefully you don't see uh, increased CPU usage from direct I.O. because that should be faster 100% of the time than uh, the AIO stuff you ring is replacing. I see very little performance difference between the two, but then also Postgres's direct I.O. support, that's also in my patch that is so crappy that I'm not sure that's okay. something to take <laughs> anything from. But you already ma also mentioned it uh, uh, yesterday, then uh, if you use this for uh, your writes, you have a problem, right? So it's only on writes you have a problem, not on reads. Yeah, the performance problem I see was purely on uh, writes, because on reads, IO Uring for buffered reads supports, uh, or just the general reads is called, and with uh, supports a flag that 
allows it to return, like to quickly test whether there is any data in the cache, and if so, it doesn't have to spawn the worker thread, and that's kind of makes the problem much, much less well, pronounced. It's, it's only about buffer that you, in your case. So yes. with ODRX, the story is different. Yes. Yeah, because we always advance you to use, and in fact, during the past two days, when I saw all the problems people reporting about uh, kernel memory management, uh, we are doing better currently to use our own buffer pool. So probably for Postgres SQL, it makes sense to investigate this as well. I think we're, going to have to use odirect for very well tuned databases and use buffered io for the untuned databases which is unfortunately a very large fraction of postgres databases so i think we are going to need to support both and probably default to not using direct io so one of the things that uh, jens and i talked about after you mentioned the mutex contention uh, in the buffered io write path again this is only the buffered io write path uh, the file systems uh, all call uh, something called balanced dirty pages uh, which is basically us asking the memory management system if there, we've made too many dirty pages and should we wait. And when the me memory management system says, yes, you need to wait now, uh, we do this with the inode lock held, uh, which seems unwise. <laughs> uh, it, it's really not a good way to decrease contention on the inode lock because we're waiting for an arbitrary period of time for no reason with it held. Uh, so that's some low-hanging fruit to make that better. Here or per file system here? It, it's actually per file system, but we've all done it the same way. <laughs> okay, copy paste. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the side question about this do you have any kind of tuning for throttling about how many IO you will accept in parallel? Could, so you, could you repeat the question? So, how many IO writes and IO reads you will accept in parallel? Uh, At the side? moment, it's. Uh, I'm the patch that is in such an early state that I have just hard coded it, and I haven't done enough benchmarks to well, well, come that, to conclusions. For, for that, at least in the case of direct I was think fixing the rate no wait uh, thing will help because as soon as you start getting E again, uh, you know you'll you'll have to wait and, and throttle them. I think. Well, we but we expect a lot of I/O to block, so that's fine. And we <coughs> but we often have drives with lock pretty deep, deep queues and it's fine for us to use yeah. those queues. So um, it probably needs to be a bit more complicated depending on what we, on the workload. Yeah, because from next problems uh, later, you will see them, we have some strange situations and we don't, we can hit some starvation of the storage, which we cannot explain on file system layer, whatever. And it uh, seems like we need to get visibility on all layers to understand what happens. So in fact, well, you will see later when we do more writes, we are going faster for no reason. So in fact, okay. Yeah. Um, so let's finish with IU urine. So any other feedback? So how you feel it? So everybody tested this already? Or so, so Matt, have you done benchmarking? Do I remember right? I haven't done any benchmarking. As far as I know, it's always better. Yes, Except well, for buffered right. device <laughs> vendor, device vendor. So it's a good way to uh, to really test the device. You for, for slow-ish device, at least you you get very close to or same as what SPDK gives you, because there's still a, a, a in terms of the overhead, SPDK is still way lower. So if you have a really 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 fast device, SPDK will still beat IO ring. Uh, but uh, compared to AI, oh, definitely yes, it's it's win everywhere. So in our uh, Oracle Linux team made some testing, but on pure radio again. So they observed something up to 15% better performance than classic AIO. Uh, well, it's uh, as it represents in fact big changes because it's not fully compatible, right, with uh, classic AIO interface. So it, the code should be adapted. And uh, so, well, 15%, I expected to see something more bigger, you know, to, to really motivate the developers. So well, I... Well, the, 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 the thing is, it's saving on your, basically your CPU and the system call costs. So what's, the, what's in your overall uh, IO uh, latency or IO completion time, what's the percentage of that part? 
because there's the device part that you can't get away uh, with. So it's still there. And uh, it's going to depend, the, the percentage gain you're going to see is going to depend on how fast your device is. Especially on uh, the first day here, there was a guy speaking about uh, scheduling, optimization, and so on. And as soon as you're IO bound, they support it. Okay, it's not impacting. In fact, I don't know if people realize, but today storage is so fast, then everything is CPU bound. So pure IO. That bound is local. not <laughs> so <laughs> true. Because well, you say a device is so fast, so take a, a, a good enterprise SSD, you're still 50, 60 nanoseconds per I.O. Yeah. Uh, and it, your, your whole stack is eating, what, two, three I.O. seconds? No, no. Microsecond? With, with, uh, so with MySQL, uh, to deliver, uh, to saturate the storage, obtain storage, 48 cores were using... No, but local. obtain is 10 microseconds. That's a different class of storage. Agree, agree. So I'm talking about normal flash enterprise SSD. The I.O. stack uh, overhead in the entire I.O. pass is still very small. So I.O. ring, yes, you have some gain, but it, in terms of percentage, it's, it's minimal. If you go to obtain your 15 microsecond reads, yeah, okay, that's, that's way smaller. And then the, the, what, four or five microsecond of the I.O. stack is, is a big chunk of, of the overall I.O. time. So yeah, but you gain. At the end, even uh, on, on the remote storage, going by the network, so network is CPU, your I.O. is CPU, and then if you use Obtain, it will be fast enough, and again, you need CPU to work yes. with the network. Yes. So, uh, here. Actually, good question for the crowd. Um, how many people here have used I.O.U. Ring? Okay. Um, how many people here would be deploying on SSDs? Okay. How many people here would be deploying with an NVRAM controller with the right cache in the way? Okay. How many people here would be deploying on VMs? And AWS, Azure, cloud systems. Okay. So we have a fairly wide range of users. That was the... Yeah. Generally today, if you don't use flash storage, then you really don't like your data, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a lot of data. Uh, e even a lot, so in fact, uh, well, you t today when you, when you see flash, it becomes cheaper and cheaper, so. Right. Part of the problem you have with that is lifetimes. If you have to guarantee five, six, seven year appliance lifetimes, SSDs and a constant write load become an interesting trade-off. See, so, well, probably next year we'll be able to, to show the solution about this. Uh, uh, in, indeed, it's very exciting, but, yeah. yeah. So, so I guess to, I guess, summarize the session, there, there was some low-hanging fruit in the way that buffered I.O. writes occur um, that can be addressed. Um, was there any other major sort of gaps that people identified? Uh, no wait for writes. Uh, writes. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I think you're up next. Or interlude. Um, can people introduce themselves as they um, uh, pick up the mic?
anyone with a, a laptop open, feel free to join the etherpad on the URL on the front and uh, help take notes with me. <laughs> so I basically just wanted to discuss an idea or something that I maybe don't quite understand. Oh, yeah. So I'm Sergei Galuchik. I work in MariaDB Corporation and as VP MariaDB Server Engineer. And I was working on MySQL since like 1998. So, yeah. So that's basically just to discuss an idea and something that maybe I don't quite understand because it seems so obvious. I don't know why I was able to find that little information about it. So, um, the thing is that for write ahead, write ahead login and Many databases do that, so it's not like something like particularly unique. You need to write in the log, you need to make sure that hits the disk and then you write to the data. And <coughs> this can be done if you just have sync after writing the log. But it's really too expensive. And what would make a much cheaper library alternative would be a disk write barrier. And <coughs> because if we do just do two writes, we need them ordered, we need to show the we need to be sure that the first write happens and is actually physically written before the second one. So you don't care when will it particular happen. And again, I think it guarantees that it will happen, well, when you think that, again, that's too heavy. Yes, so I found that thing that existed in Linux kernel earlier. That was removed and it was done in drivers for file system. It was removed because it was found to be like too heavy and providing too strong guarantees, not what was really requested. And they said inside the file system just need to ensure that just need to care about it themselves. And this is apparently what databases do, but <laughs> it also looks like if all databases do that and are it does looks to me like this belongs actually to the kernel. And this is what yeah, the chart that shows basically what a write barrier is. It has a sense like mem mem memory barrier. So this is a write coming in this uh, chronological order with like first one, second one, and so on. And the kernel, disk controller, whatever, they can do all the writes. And there's a, there's a work, uh, I don't have pointers, but I can Google them up later if anybody's interested. That this they perform better if you really do lots of writes. So they have lots of, instead of like, I don't know, syncing after every block, if they have lots of logs, they can reorder them to do, well, provide better performance. So they can optimize writes better if they have lots of writes in the queue so that they can reorder them optimally. So that basically those barriers tell the anything below the database that can reorder write. Not to reorder write across barriers, but they can freely reorder write between two barriers. And that's all it is. And this provides those order to write guarantees that many databases need. And, there's, and if that would be an F-sync, F-sync means basic here, F-sync would mean basically wait until all this is written. And this all could wait and Right barrier, just issues right barrier and everything continues and eventually later this all be written, this all be written in this order. But we don't need to wait until we actually have to, we only need to wait at commit point. Yes. Have you measured how much uh, of the benefit you can get by using IO Uring? Because you can actually have drain operations inside the queue we, we and have F syncs also no, asynchronously? No, no, we are looking at Uring, at uh, Uring, we didn't try it yet. So uh, ju just um, to clarify, so on, on the picture here, the, the vertical thing are you the barriers you're interested in. So it could be F sync today, yeah, but yeah, you that's, want that's, that. That's, that's I said, F it, it could, could be sync. It is F sync now, but F sync is more expensive in okay. the sense that you have to wait. And, and, and this uh, one is just prevents it just prevents reordering, but it does not. Okay. So one more question, just to clarify. Uh, uh, are you, uh, do you have a strong requirement for the rights between the, the, the barrier or sync to be in order or is it just a chunk of rights uh, uh, order with the barriers? So can I have, for example, the rights in, in the middle here between the two barriers being 
reordered. Do you I, care about that? I don't understand. So the rights have to be, say, they are sequential. They have to be sequential or not? No. Uh, uh, the barrier simply prevent those reordering. The oh, reordering. You, or reordering this across the barriers. Within the barrier is fine. Hmm? Reordering yeah. within it, it, the barriers is fine. Yes, okay. exactly. That's the whole point. Right. So, so uh, that's oh, what I'm, makes I'm sense from the database point of view. Just to clarify, this is write across multiple files. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. So that this thing, it actually because you it need could to have been an API that says you, you just want these two particular writes to be in this order. You can reorder everything else, but I think it'll be probably a lot more complex. So to even think about right, that because you need to so write. This is a simpler write barrier. You, so you need to write to the log file. Yes. You need those to complete before you start writing Precisely. to the database. Say this is the write, write to the log file. This is the write to the data file. This is again write to the log file. So how many? This is again log file. This is the data file related to this log file. Right. How so many? How many log files and how many data files are there at one time? So b b by default. In the DB, there are two log files, but how many database files? Yeah, data files. Th there can be a lot of data files. That's not the point because there are also this could be also other applications running doing other rights. And from this from the uh, I don't know Does disk point of view, it doesn't know which one belongs to which. So and so I just see a stream of rights. And we can and. And so the simple case, we just want to prevent reordering across the So across does the, the barrier operation apply to all writes coming from the same process? No, no not necessarily. So as how I said, you, as I said you, it could be, I, I don't know how it could how, look. How, how do you tell the kernel which yes. file descriptors yes. the barrier so, applies so to? So in the most simple way, it could just be some point in the whole stream of requests to write something to disk and to prevent reordering those writes to those blocks and those writes. In the, if it'll be a very fine grained interface where I say this write to this file should be before that write to that file, that'll be also fine. But it'll probably be a lot more complicated to implement uh, on the lower level. So but it could be anything between this one or that one or anything between those two. Of course, all the database actually need to say that this write should be so this file should be before that write to that file. So at, at least from an interface point of view, as was mentioned, uh, IOU ring is where we're hoping this kind of thing uh, will be available or yeah. will be used because it's already in the interface, right? Okay. Um, and, and this is exactly why it's there. One of the problems, one of the reasons why it was taken out of the kernel in the past is because in general, it assumes way too much knowledge about what needs to happen on an individual file system level in order for something to be fully consistent on disk. Uh, and file systems, they actually, yes, they actually do have uh, right barriers to, ch to between right, right into the journal and right into the files. But they, there's no way to export this to the user land and let applications to control the right between different rights to different files. Yeah, and, 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 and so the problem that we have is some of the times, like if you're in a file system, this these barriers are going to be F-syncs yeah. that hopefully we queue up with IOU ring. Yeah. Uh, and if you're down at a block device level, uh, these barriers are going to be simple cache flushes. Yeah. Again, hopefully queued up with IOU ring. And the really great thing about the IOU ring interface is that it actually allows you to change to chain these things uh, so that you can actually send them in via a single system call without having to wait for the results. Yes, uh, yes, that was basically the main point because if you would if you would flush after every single uh, log write that would that would basically mean a full stop after every write but if there's do many writes to different files and then you do one even if it's flush and cache flush and somebody down below waits it still can group them efficiently the way that uh, hardware can do to optimize its performance but, but so I hope this is here today in IOU ring. Okay. Uh, it's certainly the right. intention. <clears throat> yeah, I guess my question was related to um, if you're not waiting, you're just trying to enforce ordering, um, how would you know that the device is not going to reorder those in their device queue? Well, uh, well, that's the point of this uh, thing. 
it, it means that it should not be reordered across the barriers. It's not a feature that exists, a feature that I'm discussing that would be make, which would be so make a lot of sense to have and pr probably something that ring, the IO ring already has. So, so this is not just at the OS level, it has to send a request to the device to also enforce that type of barrier. Yeah, yes, for, de for device it might be a cache flush. Yes. Yes, this is, well, that's the point that a database, it shouldn't really know or care about those details. And the driver, if the driver knows it's multi-queue device and then the driver will do F sync on all the queues or whatever, it's just like the application would do. Yeah. So, okay. uh, I haven't used IO Uring, uh, so the extent of my knowledge is the LWN article. Um, but what I read is that the completion queue um, implies that operations can be uh, completed in different order, right? Uh, is there a way to enforce a barrier then based on that? You know, it seems no. like something. No way. No, yeah. Sorry, Daniel. not happening. Daniel. <laughs> So, the so there is the, the IO ring. Uh, right sorry, right. And, and by barrier here, I mean so in, in the context, not in the context of the storage, but in the context of um, oh. Sergey's proposals, Did right? You know so, in order, you mean? Uh, uh -huh. so the IO U ring specification has a way to say um, this operation can only start after this other operation is complete. And so that chaining logic is arbitrary. It could right. be a write that happens after a read, or a read that happens after a write, or an F sync that happens after a write, or arbitrary combinations thereof. Right. Um, and so that's why I was saying, you know, it's it's meant to be able to provide this kind of operation where, you know, something that you send down is the barrier, whether it be a cache flush uh, if you're on a device, or an F sync if you're on a file system, or whatever you might need, uh, and then it allows reordering, uh, as you say, because there's no implicit ordering unless you specifically apply the chaining flag, there's no explicit ordering uh, of what happens. Did that answer? It does, yeah. Okay. So, so I'm curious because we use write barriers and say, okay, I want this right and then this right, and we're going to use a barrier so all the other writes get carried with it in order to enforce the ordering of those two. Why is it we can't use <coughs> FUA and native command queuing at the disk level in order to enforce that ordering instead of having to have a full flush? Because you're going to you're going to kill the device performance if you uh, enforce that. And, and basically, just turn the write cache off on your device, and that's what you're going to get. Except the other writes can then be ordered any way you want, and you don't need to have the barriers to force unwanted writes to go with it. It's, well, uh, so on any NVMe SSD, I'd say probably it's not going to change much. Uh, on the NGD, definitely it's a kill. You, you're, it's, Run your SGD with write cache disable, and that's what you're going to get. And okay. uh, with write cache disable, no, it's going to be horrible. SGDs with write cache disable are really horrible. They're horrible, but sometimes you have to. You either have to use FUA or you have to turn off the cache. In order yes, to make sure no, it's uh, for that I can see, yes, I know. I'm just talking about performance here. So uh, <laughs> in respect to the, to the FUA, the, the way file systems implement barrier operations for journal commits is uh, first we do the cache flush to get everything that the transaction might depend on on disk. And then usually the file systems have some block that's really important, uh, super block, root block of the B tree, whatever it might be. Um, and then we'll fool it down that one last block. So we do use the FUA bits, uh, but we don't use it on every I.O. Uh, we use it for the specific thing that needs to happen right this very second. And also doesn't have any other timing dependencies. Like that super block, it doesn't matter if it's going down in parallel with a whole bunch of other writes that aren't dependent on the transaction. Uh, it's, it just needs to be the thing that finishes the transaction. 
just to clarify here, FUE, uh, FUA, uh, the, the force unit access, is, is going to guarantee that it's going to medium, so you don't need another flush. It's not guaranteeing anything on the ordering. The HDD can still do that right FUA in any order it wants with other read and writes. That's why I said it had to be in combination with NCQ. You couldn't do it just and let the disk reorder. You had to give it an order queue. That doesn't exist in the specs. The, the order tags in SCSI, for example, uh, are there. Nobody ever implemented that. <laughs> and the block I was tagging Linux doesn't care about the tag number, and it's, it's not there either. And NCQ doesn't have Tada doesn't have any. Yeah. But now, if we bring this to practice, how it works, so in fact, uh, uh, in most configuration, directory users use it for InnoDB, so for any page write, as soon as you do write, you know then it's no. stored. Direct IO. Uh, no, direct IO. Direct IO. No, I mean it's going to storage, right? No, no it's going no. to the uh, on disk mem cache. on disk cache. Well, the storage has a cache, and it goes to the cache on the disk. Going on storage layer. Let's call it like this. Not on. Yes, yes, but if if the power will disappear, it will not be written down. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But so, well, well that's, that's what's important. Okay, but it's going already on yes. the storage layer, right? Yes. So, in fact, uh, one, once you will call it sync, so well, even with directory, so we have to call it sync. And the only, what's important is when you want to remove the page from the cache, then you want to be sure that it was already written. Yeah. So, well, in fact, once you, yep. you made you made sync for the file, you know, then up to this layer. It's yes, we uh, sync. You, uh, you want to do sync when you want to make sure that at this point, Everything is written down, and that's what you do when commit happens. If you do some, some writes in the middle, you don't really need to. You don't really want to wait at this point. Wait, wait, wait. But if you're doing sync, there's no other choice. Yeah, but it's different story for commit because for commit you commit on. Yes, on I'm not talking regular. about commit here. Yeah, but the main point is then uh, at some point you need to to accept and confirm commit to the user because yes. during all this time user will wait. Yes, right? but but but. Do, during the transaction, you still need, might need to write to the write ahead log and the data. And at this point in time, you don't really want to wait. And but that's when, when the yeah, player would be. That's why, so InnoDB has this, uh, call it FUS uh, committee. So in fact, checkpoint. Yeah, FUS checkpoint. on checkpoint, you also want to wait. Yeah, but because during this time, in fact, uh, nobody waiting for page writes, only for redo log. So redo logs written is enough. Yeah, but this one, exactly about not waiting for redo log writes. How then you confirm that the uh, data was committed? If when you, when you do commit, you do a sync and everything up to this point is written down. Fine, so it's, uh, uh, in, in fact, when you have short transactions and we have few users. If you have, have short no transactions that don't write anything to disk, then you don't need, don't need to listen about, don't need to care about that. Well, so it's I, I think OTP one is mostly short transactions, right? Yes, there are other use cases as well, and I'm sure uh, my skill is used in these use cases, too. Very quickly, did I understand correctly that direct I.O. is, is not direct to the right buffer of the device? device. Yeah, but the device is then free to reorder things any way it wants. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I understood that. Thank you. Yeah. One of the really confusing things about file systems in direct I.O., is the direct I.O. promises that it has started the I.O. And it also, if you wait for it, it promises the I.O. has completed. But that actually is completely decoupled from whether or not that write is persistent on disk. <laughs> um, which That's a very it, key point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Linux reality, right? Yes, yeah, and, and very few people talk about this when they talk about direct I.O. because it's really a way to control the page cache a, in the kernel and very much have any, very much not have anything to do with whether or not it's actually persistent on disk. Mm -hmm. So you need to f-sync or o-sync or do a barrier or what you have to do completely depends on which file system you're writing to, but you have to do something else. You have no idea the amount of e emails I get about buy the device that are looking better. <laughs> 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 and if you dig and touch, guys, do f-sync, please. Uh, if, you, if you're a device vendor and you get many emails about that, why don't you, I don't know, better back the cache to write it down if anything happens? Well, that, that's what we tell customers. Disable the write cache, do a sync, do something, because the write No, but if, write if you put, I don't know. A
more expensive or less performant? No, if you put a battery on the cache, it's not making less performant. It just okay. so if you sorry, put uh, if you put a battery so that power won't disappear immediately, it's not making this less performant. No, but it's more expensive. More yes, powerful, more expensive. More I understand. Keeps more, more everything. And so I, I understand. It's it's, I understand it's more expensive. So I just uh, was. And, and traditionally, they tried it, so people would put you know battery back cache so they had enough time to try and keep the medium spinning. And this is for HDDs, for SSDs, it's less of a problem. And it was more expensive, and nobody wanted it because they could buy an NVRAM RAID controller okay. and put it in front of it for cheaper than what the four discs okay. behind it cost. Okay. So it, it was it was exactly a cost trade-off. Yes, exactly. So I've, I've heard about this earlier. I haven't heard about this for years. Uh, and I was I was just wondered about trade-offs if many people are complaining, but it turns out it's still more expensive. They complain, but they still don't want it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Well, for me, the conclusion would be to really look to try the earring, yes, earring, and see if it can discussion. do all that. <laughs> Another problem solved. Okay. So here, here again, it will be just one slide. Invitation for discussion. So in fact, uh, uh, InnoDB uh, designed it. Uh, so first, InnoDB is using by default 16K page writes, OK? And Linux has 4K writes. So many times I hear that 4K writes are atomic on Linux. <laughs> So last time it was huge discussion with kernel developers. So now you have to do it. So guy, okay, do it. But if you run your production with your money, so uh, so InnoDB has this solution double write. So in fact, we write in each page twice. So we have dedicated file uh, where we write first the page if it's it was okay. Then we write to the normal place. And if something crashes in the middle, so we know then we, we can recover from the first write or just discard, discard the write, and it was never happens because it was not committed, and then rewrite again. So the problem is, and we do twice more IO write operations, so all people having flash storage, they are unhappy because it will die twice faster, right? So in the past, Fusion IO delivered solution, but unfortunately, it was totally proprietary, so it well, of course, drive was uh, made by Fusion, now it's fine. So they have, uh, they implemented their own driver and own file system, which can guarantee that every write, whatever size, it will be atomic. So, but by implementing all this layer, unfortunately, it was closed source, and when Fusion was acquired by SunDisk, then SunDisk was acquired by, and I don't know how many acquisition it was, but uh, it just stopped it. At least there was a patch sent about uh, atomic flag for files. This stayed for six years now and still not in upstream. Uh, if uh, one day it will come, so at least we can bypass all the story, not twice, uh, write twice every time, and just guarantee that uh, if we use this option, then it's going up. So any expectation, any feedback on this? So, well. It sounds like you're making it a, a, a kernel issue, but how could you 
um, support anything that, well, I, I'm not, we, we should probably also define a little bit more what you mean by atomic, but uh, what I want to say is without device support and specify stuff at the device level, uh, there's no way you can make that work. You see, right now I am in direct discussion with Intel guys on Obtain. They say, we can do it by device, but Linux cannot do it. And then you have Shannon in China. They have, we do it, it's on device and it's guaranteed. And I ask them, guys, how, guys, how you can do it if Linux is not supported? So they claim they have atomic rights, but who can believe it? So it's, uh, and I think one of the comments you made is, what does it mean by O atomic? And I think it's, so I want to make sure this is all completed, yeah. or it hasn't completed exactly. by the time it returns. All or nothing. In a fact, if and I that's, that's part of the problem. If I want to write 16.4K yep. in one single IO yep. operation, just. A and again, that can't happen without device support, because when it gets scheduled, um, it's four different sectors on the disk, or, or n different sectors. This one gets written, this one gets written, off we go. Okay, that means you can accept all of them written, but you'll never be able to get the uh, or none of them written part of it. You see, it's, it's flash storage, right? And on flash storage, we're always writing new blocks. We are not rewrite. So you always can say then it was finished it totally or you just come back, right? And the same with lots of other smarter storage systems. Like if you have like some network attached storage, the other side probably can provide that on its own level because it has enough battery cache, date RAM, NVRM that can or that can provide like atomic rights over larger uh, sectors. And like a lot of hardware provides that and a lot of the uh, cloud type block storage also provides that. So it's like not like impossible. No, I just want to clarify that everybody accepts it requires uh, device support, but what we is saying that even when devices do support it, uh, Linux doesn't allow application to use that. Okay, so just to clarify, O-Atomic, you mean the data is all in or nothing is in? Yeah. It's not about completion. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's not, it's not just that the data is all in or nothing is in, it's the data is all in or the old data is completely intact and unchanged. Yeah. Exactly. On disk. And so um, the, the file system, so ButterFS uh, at least has the ability to do this because it's copy on right. Uh, the XFS developers have, uh, I think, really serious efforts to add interfaces to do this, I believe, via the XFS copy on write machinery. Uh, I haven't looked at it closely. Um, there are performance implications to that, right? Because, you know, you're doing copy on write at the file system level and it's not the same as uh, writing in place. Um, the Fusion I.O. implementation, I don't expect to see, uh, largely because there, there just were a number of corner cases that it didn't deal with that I think um, I, were certainly acceptable in a really specific data center environment where you're able to curate exactly what's going on and make a lot of rules for how the files are used. But I don't think it's a great general purpose solution. And I can say that because I wrote it. Yeah, you see, <laughs> BGRFS, so I, I tested, so it looks promising, but performance is like yeah, it, so ButterFS is not meant for this workload, right? ZFS, not, yeah. ZFS is too aggressive, so it, it, it's good, but uh, this copy on write story, and you do much more, you do twice, three times more, because by design it will recheck every time, then it was really written, and so you can get the same performance, but you need three times more IO traffic. Right. And again, at the end, so people complain, and then you still need to rebuild, in one year you still rebuild your old file system, when it's 100 terabytes, well, okay. it's not easy, yeah. right? I and yeah, so just to agree with you, ButterFS will not work well for this. Um, at least for the MySQL workload, it's not what it's meant yeah. for. Uh, XFS, certainly that is, it's bread and butter, right? I don't know if their copy on write support works well in this configuration or not. All that right. would be a question for them. Question, um, you know, SQLite doesn't have the choice of what file system it's using. We just use whatever the application hands to us. How can we find out whether or not this is supported? Well, so right is, now that answer is super easy because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so nobody exports Oatomic right now. Um, I, I believe, you know, there are some patches in the works that uh, I, I certainly expect to happen relatively soon. Well, we've got we, F2FS. We can do it with F2FS. Okay.
and, and we've just got some funky IOCTLs that we have to call to figure out whether or not we can do it. But it'd be nice if we had like some kind of standard interface that would say, oh, we support this capability or we don't. Yeah, it, it would, I agree. So in fact, right now you have uh, a copy on write solution or something if you incremental like MyRox and RoxDB doing, so you are more safe on this, but, but so then you have more rights. So uh, a solution that is implemented purely by software at the file system level would be fine to you guys? You don't require anything on the device side? Say, say that again? Just, just to be sure. Say again? Do you want that both only at the file system level? Is it fine with such a solution? Or you also want something at the device level? I, I, think, I think MySQL is unique because they have a, it, it's actually possible with MySQL for OAtomic to be useful. Like they, they need 16K blocks um, that's bigger than 4K, um, but it's small enough that it's reasonable for, for us to ask the hardware to do this. And for whatever reason, us asking the hardware people has never worked out. Where the hardware people say, oh, yeah, we can do 16K, what else do you need? And then the file system people say, well, actually, how about infinite? <laughs> uh, just to be clear, the same exists for true for Postgres. We have just we don't use a double write buffer, but otherwise we have the same problem. And our blocks are eight K by default, so it's very similar story. So you see, I the story is pretty amazing because uh, so right now you, you need historical uh, double write buffer on InnoDB. It was just in the system space. Now it can be anywhere. So in fact. Uh, what was amazing and 15 years ago, Seagate delivered storage, which, wo which was having persistent memory on board. And in fact, today we could be able to, this, to use this solution just to place double write uh, uh, writing to this persistent memory, which will be extremely fast and safe because it's on the same device and continue to write to the flash device. Unfortunately, nobody wanted this and there is no way, so we got the device, but there was even no driver for this. So this kind of solution can work. Uh, so we tested also Intel persistent memory, so which was reported by Google the same way. So we wanted to place double write on this device. Unfortunately, Linux today, uh, when it, you run file system on persistent memory, it's uh, give it giving you worse uh, performance than if you use obtain like SSD. So it's again about the software. So if we place double write on persistent memory, we have worse performance if we place it on just another obtained device. So well, again about software. So once it will be improved, then probably the story will be better. But, but you will not get rid, get rid of double write with OATOMIC. It's always going to be somewhere. <coughs> I, I agree. but. You see, my point here is, and in any case, on flash storage, we still write new blocks. Okay, you 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 not rewrite the same pages, right? So you can say you can always roll back. In fact, well, but you can roll back. What I mean? So if write was not finished, yet, you can say it was not finished, yet, and just your uh, your previous image is just write image, right? So you see, this is right this is a reason why Oracle database don't see all these problems because they m create their own layer. They don't use file system. They use ASM, doing everything, zero device, and that's all. And we are uh, so two kind of users, right? People want to true. see files. I mean, the Oracle file, the Oracle just pretends 64K will be atomic. <laughs> 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 yeah, 64K is atomic. I've declared it. You know. If with closed source software, it's so easy, right? You just believe slides, and that's what you cannot check, right? <laughs> so. um, which brings up a question. Instead of putting all of the device, trying to push the, de the support down to the device, why don't we try and incorporate persistent memory as a staging area? Because what we really want is a fast write that we can walk away from and then drain it back down to the device. 
so that it either gets to the device this time or it gets to the device next time. But we either finish the write or we don't in something fast, and then we can manage draining it to, to media. So take a generic interface based on persistent memory, make that available to all of the file systems so the poor device vendors aren't stuck with it. Yeah, but that's why if you can have a device which uh, has, you see, this double write zone is very small. It's, it's just one megabyte, let's say. But so, uh, you know, if somebody needs to buy additional device for one megabyte of data, or, uh, you know, we look silly. So if it's integrated on the chip on, or on the drive and we just address it, and it's just on the same storage, it but works. They're oh, starting okay. to do NV dims that you could use as memory. And I'm not sure if they're going to be successful or not, but, but that was one of the things we looked at. Was no, just uh, make that's an interesting discussion that it's not necessarily in this talk. It's uh, should then be put in NVMe as well, as <laughs> plug into it, and then uh, have it take over there. But I mean, it's also the case that Linux needs to support it at some point, because it's not just on the storage level, because if you have like a network, like a cloud type pro uh, storage protocol, they support that today. Like you can do atomic writes over Google's uh, block device store. They support that and it, they can just emulate it on the other uh, side because that's, they support it, but Linux can't support it if you use anything larger than 4K. So that side also needs to improve and it's a really large improvement to not do double writes in that case because we don't send it over the wire, which like literally reduces the uh, the volume by two. I was just uh, uh, pointing out that if we want that support, having it, I'm all, I'm all for it. But if we push it down, uh, as down to, to, to the, the device, the discussion is not just Linux anymore. It's T10, T13, NVMe. It's much bigger. It's multi-year effort. And uh, so do we really need atomicity of the right supported down to the device? Or can we do things like adding NVRAM or uh, copy on write or whatever other software method, just stop at Linux level uh, to, to do the atomic writes? Because we see there was also another proposal just to use a journaling on file system, which will guarantee you, right? And again, it was, <laughs> it, it was not confirmed, so. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, so, well. So I I'm also curious how this so, uh, search, uh, Shannon is working with MariaDB, right? So, and they claiming to have atomic rights. And I discussed it with these guys, how you do it if you, you cannot guarantee that all layers are atomic, right? But, well, probably in China they have different stuff that I don't know. Yeah, I just had one question, which is if the device vendor is going to guarantee that, you know, your, your rights are atomic in some sense, is it the case then they're just saying use O direct? Is that what is is that all that the no that they, they are saying that the device can do it, but no, no, but no. Linux really isn't exposing it. There's nothing today to guarantee. If you go to the vendor, you still don't need to write command, you will it. I I mean I mean from like the point of like a cloud vendor or whatever offering network attached storage, is the cloud vendor saying, you know, we've got mad no, sorry. I know that Google says on their special verified kernel and they and over their block device, whatever, I forgot the name of the, their block device, they support it and you better hope that they're right and <laughs> like the guarantee, they, I heard them talk about it, like it was very, uh, I guess you hope. Yeah, so uh, Odirect comes into the equation just because it is the easiest way for an application to give uh, a, a single chunk of I.O. to the kernel and have a path where we expect it to go down in a 16K unit. Um, it, doesn't, it actually doesn't always happen. There are nasty corner cases in there that are really hard to get rid of. But it, Odirect is the easiest way for an application to talk to a block device. So you see on, on ZFS appliance uh, guys implementing this. And unfortunately, oh, no, well, pe pe people did not buy it enough, so it's going down, right? But it was possible to do, and especially they even implemented an NFS interface, which could be direct NFS, and you can send whatever block you want, it, it will be atomic. 
They Just because it was ZFS in the background. They also had an SSD in front of the array. Yeah, so in fact, <laughs> we have everything and we have nothing in fact, right? <laughs> so it's part of that group. So, yeah. <laughs> so if I understand well, no expectation for at all atomic. <laughs> I think we've concluded it, it's hard to do at the device level, um, and, and it probably isn't cost efficient to do it at the device level, but looking for a facility where you can manage something that's persistent and something that's not a, that's not atomic um, on the way, like Google has apparently done under the covers, is probably worth thinking about and creating an interface for. Well, and, and I would talk with the XFS developers about their, uh, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but their copy on write based atomic plan because Christoph is coming tomorrow I, I, it'll be a real thing like is that the first you mean uh, XFS. XFS yes e XFS has a copy on write mechanism it's like everything else in XFS it really depends on a lot of the layout whether it's going to be performant or not um, but it does work uh, we'll speak, we speak about XFS just in 10 minutes so. okay so from my side, I will try to motivate uh, storage vendors. Uh, we are working. So <laughs> Intel is very motivated to put obtain uh, with atomic write. So if, uh, let's see, if vendors will have it, what will be about Linux, right? So <coughs> the next topic will be about the XT4. So this is pretty amazing story. So in fact, uh, historically, uh, we always get better performance uh, with MySQL on, on the XT4. Uh, XFS was reported good for any generic workload, but when you start uh, MySQL, it was always slower comparing to XT4. So I saw them the same story for progressive SQL guys as well. But uh, s the story started changing just recently. So in fact, uh, I was uh, running my test workloads on my machine and I uh, was surprised that so we have most of same configuration in the lab for all uh, guys, you know, for every benchmark testing. And I was surprised that this exactly the same machine, which was showing exactly the same result a few months ago, started to show twice worse result. And the reason was that just guys upgraded the kernel. Well, this was a pretty amazing discovery, which I bring back to Oracle Linux guys, and we have, uh, so here you can see, uh, this was the old kernel, the blue line, so it's kernel 3, 4.1. Uh, so, well, this was uh, Oracle Linux, but... Where did you have it? Ah, sorry. <laughs> this is number of transactions per second. These are, uh, it's coming from one concurrent user, two, four, and so on. So till 1,000, okay? So it's just growing. In fact, all graphs, and I will show you, uh, they are like this. So it's just TPS or queries per second, and it's growing load from one user to 1,000. 2024. How do you know it's XT4 that's different than other than uh, Because it's, uh, it, we only use XT4, nothing else. So nothing reported around. It just kernel changes and with XT4. And this is the story. Even the latest one, kernel 5, having the same. The workload is IO bone. So in fact, you don't see it if you have everything in memory. It will just write a little bit. This is when you have a mix of read and write in parallel. So. What's the backing device? Uh, in, in backup, it's obtained. Okay. So it's, you, you have a merge. And also, this workload is not totally IO bound uh, aggressively. So you still have merge on the storage. Storage is not saturated. So in fact, uh, well, my impression then we, we hit some kind of saturation on the file system layer. I don't know how, how it happens. The problem is um, there is no instrumentation, no feedback. Well, at least, uh, yep. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So it's what, so it's, what Oracle Linux guys ask at me, so they give me this, give me this. So I suppose that then expect that I will never collect this and it will be fine. So I collected everything, <laughs> no feedback, nothing to say. So yes, fine, we have data, but nothing to say what happens. Do you think so it's too different from, from the older Linux, the OS? It's different from the fabric of the OS. Uh, 
I, I did not say any difference. So, so, so which, which kernels were involved here? I, I, I'm sorry, I can't see the labels. So in fact, kernel four three, four kernel 4.1 was still okay. And then after 4.14 something, it started to go down. Oh, All right. Well, so it, it's hard to guess from the uh, from the graph. Um, I, I would expect. Uh, I mean, so XFS and MySQL is what Facebook uses internally. You know, we have certainly no performance problems on XFS with MySQL. Um, I would expect them both to be roughly I/O bound to the speed of the device, plus or minus uh, locking in the kernel. Um, and so I, I would think with configuration they should both be equal. So it's certainly surprising to hear that one is better than the other. Um, for this, my guess, just looking at the graph, is either the multi-queue stuff or somewhere in the four, between four, six and higher kernels, uh, extended four realized that uh, their implementation of uh, data ordered. So this is what uh, the file systems do in order to make sure that we don't expose stale blocks on disk. I forget the exact kernel version where they found the bug, but they realized that it was not actually ordering 100% of the time. Uh, so they added additional correctness, which not surprisingly is often additional slowness. Um, so why? It, why yep. slower? So sure. It, yeah, it, it should. It's it, corrected. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have mount that to the to disable that. So yes. You could try. It's it's easily testable. Oh. Uh, just test data write back <laughs> versus uh, see uh, okay, mount binary, data. Binary equals zero or one, so try yeah. to enable and uh, data write back equal uh, system enable. Yeah, I think I always run and test with barrier zero. And, oh. and with data equals write back or data equals order equals order? Uh, I think we switch it to what is by default now. Yeah. So so that is something that changed somewhere in the four series. I'm sorry, I forget where. But so um, th this should be, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to figure it out. So yeah. But it's probably not going to come back. And I mean, if it's. <laughs> <a> <laughs> you see, uh, ju just a comment. The most painful for me here, just to see them, there is no instrumentation just to see what is wrong. Then there is no feedback from so. Yeah. Yeah, but well, what I mean then from file system layer, you know. It, uh, everybody use file system, right? So you should have some kind of uh, instrumentation inside, or I don't know, from pair, from whatever else. Then you can see that they have some bad events or something. But happen. you do. But that's all there. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I, I think there are trace points for BFS, CXT4, and the block layer, right? Finally, yeah. Um, well. Fine, but what about because kernel five? Because that was fixed <laughs> along the way. Now it's just like yeah. nobody gets any more. But kernel five is the same problem. Oh, so uh, there yeah. are a lot of ways that I would look at this. I mean, are we using more CPU? Are we doing more physical I/O? Are we spending no. more time waiting? Like so we have a lot of metrics that I would use to figure out what's going on. It shouldn't be that complicated. Yeah, but. It's, well, I did not put, if you want, I have all the metrics, if you are curious about. So yes, of course, this is, we have worse performance, so we we'll, we'll do less I.O. and so on. So one of the uh, feeling myself I have then uh, in the latest kernel, what was fixed is uh, it was scalability problem about uh, uh, direct I.O. I.O. reads. Before it was not scaling, so you can easily saturate when you use direct I.O. On XT4, you were limited. You just uh, hit on uh, contention in the kernel, and you cannot read anymore. And my feelings, and before uh, this limitation was was doing some kind of throttling, because the problem is you read and you write on the same time. You have a mix of this, and uh, users can read too much. So in fact, your writes will will be uh, stored waiting them before reads finish it. So something happens on storage layer, which is not reported from nowhere, probably rep reported somewhere internally. But well, <coughs> until now, I did not find any guys 
with uh, file system skills which can look inside and point on something. This is a something they fix, it's not going to get any better. We had the same problem with UDP packets. We switched from an ancient kernel to 4.9, and suddenly our packets per second dropped. And we went through and did the bisection, and there was a big, there was a big chunk of work to reduce UDP packet latency. And it turns out in reducing latency, they also reduced the ability to generate packets per second. So we realized we had to find a different way to get our performance back. <laughs> You see, I cannot advise MySQL users not upgrade your kernel if you use HT4, right? So it will be. No, no, but if you find uh, that that thing with the bonus, then why is it still not working? Yeah, you should be okay. You can find out what the contribution is. Sorry. Sorry. It, at least you can figure out what the change was. Mm -hmm. Even if you can't see it in the block traces, you can at least find out what the change was and what the motivation was, and then you can go buy the developer a drink and argue about it. <laughs> I think first I will need to blog about the problem. So I <laughs> expect that you know that here we'll find a solution. Uh, so probably it should be just mention it and people will look on this. Dimitri, or you can go the tracing way. Since the, uh, the problem lies between the problem, well, the, the symptom lies between 4.1 and 4.14, you should have trace points for those uh, for those versions, and it should be very easy to visit trace points that are available, so you can get like a feeling. Uh, where is the latency, for example, increased? Is it at block layer, or is it something uh, up the stack like ext4? Trace point? You mean from the perf trace point, or yeah, you can instrument it with perf. Uh, you can use ubpf. Should be available starting from 4.1, not sure how many features are out there. Yeah, you see, but I you expect- You get a feeling, you know, how much, uh, for example, latency is a, a kernel upgrade introducing, for example, yeah. assuming that's the issue. I expect in the people who are working on file system, you know, this is kind of a generic problem. You you should deliver something like uh, your stat, which is showing you then something going wrong, or you have, because saturation layer uh, well, you, can, you cannot just discover. So many people may have it in production, on cloud, whatever you want. So you, you s the storage is the same, right? So it's just doing what it can. So something happens on the file system layer. And why? So an, a, any device can be here. So in fact, in my case, it was obtained. Oracle Linux guy discovered the same on their NVMe, which is not that fast and so on, but the tendency is the same. And so here is twice. Uh, double regression, so you, well, you may have 30%, 20 Do you expect to see the same regression with other uh, storage vendors, storage solutions? Yeah, yeah exactly. Y you see it yeah, already. It's not only, so because, well, <laughs> you will see on, on the, the, the next story will be about XFS. And uh, so the first reaction was, oh, it's obtained problem, so go with Intel. So then we tried to, to reproduce it on other storage, and we discovered the same story. And even on, uh, so I also test in Oracle Cloud, which is using block storage, which is remote storage and network, the story is the same. So it's pure uh, kernel layer about file system. You don't see it with XFS. So with XFS, <laughs> it's even you, more fun, guys. But you don't guys. see this it's very problem. You, <laughs> you will see. It's so I think it's, uh, is that yeah. any other comments? Well, uh, probably you can test yourself as well, but again, so people who are doing pure IO tests, they don't see the problem. And this is uh, our probably main, uh, I don't know, target and dilemmas. And uh, so in the past, we worked with many storage vendors, so Storage is very good from pure IO test, very good for Oracle database. When we run MySQL, it's just twice worse than another one. Why happens? But, well, 
It's my skill. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, in uh, I, yeah. Currently, I'm preparing just a bundle of scripts, you know, then anybody can just deploy, run, and you get your story. My recommendation would be to turn it into a, a file drop. Yeah. This is the problem, again, because it's too generic and you cannot simulate everything what happens inside in the code. Run the block code to replay the block code. Uh, uh, if, if you can do it this easily with MySQL, you can make it happen with Bash. I guarantee you can make it happen with Bash. Uh, Interesting. Okay, there was another question. Yeah. You mean if I collect block trace, I can replay it with? Uh, Why don't you replay a block trace? Yeah, block, block trace itself has a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but how it will it will replay? It will just reap. Well, it will just replay it. Like the the problem with this kind of yeah. kind of experiment. Yeah. The, the problem with doing this via a block trace reproduction is that the bug is probably either generating extra I/O or generating extra weight. And so the block trace will certainly make that. The problem is weight happens uh, somewhere else for because some kind of condition happens. Uh, will it be seen in block in block trace on this thing? Okay, interesting point. So I will note this. Uh, okay, so uh, I will prepare the test case as well and uh, and see on the on the block trace. Um, well, while we're at um, the last bit, if the bit for um, the if there is going to be anything that you want to demo. Yeah. So and now uh, XT4 was fun enough, right? So now the story, we add in to the story XFS. <laughs> so just to show you what happens here. So you understand we have double write, so we're writing data twice, okay? The red line is XFS without double write, okay? The blue line is XT4 we, without double write as well. So you see, twice difference. Yeah. It's what I said, and XT4 was always better in, in the past. Three. So this uh, this one is version uh, version 4.1, okay. So that's why the story changes with the latest kernel. So this is on the old kernel. So XTFS is doing worse, okay. But when we enable double write, so green line is XT4 and yellow line is XFS. So in fact, on XFS, when we do twice more writes, we are going faster. You, fo you, fo you follow the logic? <laughs> it, it's twice more rights and we have better performance. Maybe you should try three times. <laughs> I was thinking about that. So, Demir, sorry, which I.O. scheduler did you have in place for the disk at the time? I have scheduled, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, new, uh, it's the default one. Uh, Oracle Linux switched to Noop, if I recall. Well, I, I, I stopped it to look on this because in the past, so we always play it. We compare different schedulers and from. Yeah, because sometimes, and I'm trying, trying to remember, from, this is from ancient history. Um, a couple of them will delay writes to the point where it actually gets in the way of a smaller stream. Once you start pushing a harder stream, you're actually getting it scheduled on the device earlier. Um, that's one of the reasons we usually just turn it off and let the device do deal with it. So, above the 
above 412 is going to be known for an opt-in device, no scheduler, by default, unless your UDEV is changing something. Yeah, yeah, nice one. So I, I think, like, w as I was saying earlier, I would expect XFS and Extended 4 to at least be equivalent um, in pretty much every configuration. So like where uh, turning double writes off, uh, Extended 4 is doing that much better than XFS, there's something wrong. Uh, th there's a configuration error uh, on XFS that's making it slow. It's probably the alignment of the journal I.O. Uh, XFS, uh, when you make the file system, it uh, looks at the device that you're making it on and it makes some assumptions about what fast will be. Mm -hmm. uh, those assumptions are sometimes wrong. Uh, so, um, like, there are actually two different problems in that graph, right? Like, first, they should at least be equivalent or XFS may sometimes be higher because uh, it has significantly less lock contention uh, on an inode uh, during direct I.O. Because XFS allows two people to be in the direct I.O. path at once, extended for, and ButterFS do not. Um, so, uh, I don't know, there are a lot of questions there. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Any other advice? Because I switch you to the next fun slide. So, uh, this was a huge headache, you know, because it's out of logic and so on, and uh, let's call it by chance. Uh, so the, the guy who is working on the code on MinoDB, he just made something broken, which bring me uh, attention. On, so all the right part was totally broken, so we started to write uh, in chaotic manner, but it improved performance. So I started to dig on this why and trying to understand. And in fact, I discovered this very strange story about, so in, in MinoDB we have IO write threads, so which are responsible for IO writing, okay? And I just uh, retried to limit them. So because historically we'll use 16 just to, to allow more writes in parallel, but now the storage is faster. And what happened, so in fact, this is what we see, so we have a drop. When we have too much IO write threads, so we aggressively write them. And uh, this is the case, so with, uh, uh, still without double write, this is the case when we have only four IO write threads. And in fact, we reach higher performance than ext 4 so without using double write. And just because we are less aggressive on writes. If we are very aggressive, we have to slow down. Uh, how many threads are we talking about here? So here it's all under 16. So 16, it was by default uh, in all my tests, historically, because storage was slow, so you need to write more in parallel to hide the latency. How now, many did you call it? 48. What is the cube? <laughs> there you go. We, um, some years ago, we actually started trying to use NVRAM for the journal, and we actually found out that there were a number of issues where the journal pr kind of presumed that I.O. was on the order of milliseconds, and when you suddenly had I.O. on the order of small microseconds, um, lists started getting very large, things started going N squared instead of O sub 1. Um, Contention looks like the obvious issue here. Um, the fact that it got better with a smaller number of threads, so contention is almost certainly an issue, and that's one of the things with faster storage. There's a lot of things that were tested in the presence of mil millisecond per, um, behavior um, that don't do well when it becomes a microsecond behavior. So again, uh, lack of instrumentation. So at least for XFS, I found that there is a lot of tons of statistics reported. So I need to bring them and look on this to see if it makes some difference or not. But have again, I was surprised that there is nothing simple, you know, just to see there is starvation or on file system layer or not. Have you checked whether it's actually the file system layer that sounds much more likely to be on the MySQL layer that it just is contention there? I, I expected them. So my f first point was about them probably we send in too much I.O. So right now, you know, we use asynchronous I.O. with all direct. 
So it just send in many IO, so I wanted, uh, so we made the changes to limit how much we will send, did not help. So if we even will sell few AOs instead of 200 or something like no, that. No, what I mean is like that some data structures in MySQL are contended because you have too many threads and you're no. just not scaling that good. Yeah, but there is no contention on uh, MySQL layer. This is the point. So what's interesting also then, uh, I was, uh, I, I should limit concurrency on user threads because uh, our IO reads are not asynchronous so as they are uh, normal, it's direct uh, normal writes. And m more users I have, more IO reads will be done in parallel, and more it will saturate the layer, IO layer. So if I reduce number of IO reads, they will do, I have better performance. So in fact, reads are blocking writes, okay? So you need to, ha to find a balance between <coughs> IO reads and IO writes to leave them, uh, to let them live uh, uh, working together. So uh, in general, the, like I, I would suggest looking at a very high level at, from the kernel point of view, you know, have we increased <coughs> CPU usage to the contention? Um, and then if they're using it to figure out what that contention is. C CPU is not fully used at all. Um, well, it doesn't matter if it's fully used, it matters, you know, it's how it's shaped. Uh, you can search for off CPU prof profiling, uh, which is something that Brendan Gregg talks a lot about. Uh, there are a number of different ways to do it, uh, but they can tell us where we are spending our time waiting. Um, and it's actually much more informative than just uh, looking for things in D state or you know other, other ways. But uh, if we aren't spending more time waiting for CPU, uh, we're spending more time waiting for the drive. Uh, and that might be due to unfairness inside the drive, or it might be due to unfairness inside the file system. It's it's hard to say. So to make sure you're um, tying the appropriate number of CPU profiling. Awesome. Chris, do you know if um, right back throttling uh, turned up around? This is this is what 414. This kernel. Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, hopefully, the right back throttling isn't a factor in the direct I/O here, but it might be. Uh, it's certainly something to take a look at. It could also be something the cause of the extended four problems you were talking about before. There's also the block layer request limiting thing that went, I think, around, in around that time, and I saw pretty bad performance regressions in Postgres with that. So, the, you can the right back function? No, the the block on the block layer. You can there's a request throttling mechanism now, which oh, okay. reduces limit uh, the latency spikes, and I've seen that. And you can turn it off. It's like one settings, and it, I've seen that reverse performance quite badly on fast storage. Off CPU profiling can show all of those things. Uh, it would be very useful. It can show many things. Okay. So you see, this is a fast storage, and I was able to find workaround by uh, doing less writes in parallel. Okay. And to finish the story, this is a slow storage. Slow storage, but TPCC workload. IO bond as well. Small machine, it's only 12 cores. All this is D, well, and again. So the yellow line, it, well, orange line is uh, double write enabled, and all others with disabled and one IO write thread, two, and so on. Nothing helping. So how we can do better by doing more right side? Um, can, for example, if you want to put some secret in the system, but you say you're not missing opportunities, that's a potential. Oh. <coughs> um, there's a lot of subsystems where if you push them, you're not missing opportunities to schedule. Um, in a particular IO and networking is, is the kind of places you see that. So one of the things you really do want to look for is off CPU here. Because it's, it's, if it's not scheduling, it's waiting to do something. And where it's waiting to do that something is probably informative. OK. So uh, it's all about scheduling. It's nothing about uh, file system internals, what you want to say. The internals could be where the, hmm? sorry. 
the internals could be where it's happening. I mean, there's a lot of places where I just finished this, oh, and I picked it up because there's something waiting. Oh, I, there is nothing waiting, I'm gonna go walk, and it's gonna take time to wait up. So there are often overheads when you're not at full tilt boogie that aren't there when, so overheads that disappear when you go full tilt boogie that appear only when you're not there yet. The new API for networking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it switches to something that's faster if you get a higher rate of events. Yeah. But it's weird. <laughs> but it's weird. Yeah, so uh, I'm pushing also then we have better visibility also on IO layer from the code, you know, to see because right now, you know, MySQL code was just lagging about storage was faster than we can use. So it was, so the old effort was just to send more. Let's try to send more than at least we'll be able to do more probably. And now, so we realize, and okay, we can do that much and the system, system will not follow. So I know, I think the, is it the Skyler folk? Um, they have to like, they make their users do benchmarking of their um, disks in order to try and measure things like queues and so on to mm -hmm. precisely to try and avoid um, uh, getting to this case where, you know, sending too much actually makes things worse rather than better. So if things are getting that fast and getting that contended, I guess maybe you could end up in that scenario too. Yeah, but here you say the slow device. So ah, yeah. even on slow device, we discover some. Okay, thank you very much. So, well, thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's our honor here to welcome uh, Dr. Richard Hip, uh, the author of SQL Lite, who's just going to give us a talk about why it matters to kernel developers. Thank you. Thank you for letting me be here. I actually have about two hours worth of material, but I only have five minutes to present it in. So what I've done is, um, uh, oops, wrong button. I don't know how to operate a, there we go. So uh, I, I have this briefing paper here that goes into more detail about all the questions I have and, and, and that sort of thing. I'll talk about that in a minute. I just want to give you a brief introduction of what SQLite is and what it's all about. Uh, the first thing you need to know about SQLite is that it's in everything and it's in everywhere. I don't know if it's in that Sony camera, but it might be. It's certainly in your phone. Uh, it's, in your, it's in your car, probably. It's in your TV set. It's in most a lot of the applications you run on your desktop. Um, there's, uh, the, you, know, you know, a typical Android phone has about 200 uh, SQLite databases on it, and uh, they collectively do... a in excess of five gigabytes of I.O. per day per phone times two and a half billion phones is a lot of I.O. that's coming out of SQLite. If you're, if, 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 if you're a file system person, SQLite uh, is, is about half of all your, 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 your client on, on a phone. Uh, it does a lot of stuff and there's many, many other uses. So it's all over the place. Uh, it actually it's fast. I, I, you know, a lot of people think, well, it, it's a relational database. It has to be slow. Turns out that uh, we did some studies, and you can um, uh, uh, pull out a 10K blob with a database query uh, at about the same speed as you can read it from a separate file on disk. Now, this is on Linux. On other platforms, the database is a lot faster. It turns out that reading fi things from files on disk is really fast on Linux, so it's about the same speed. And of course, as the size of the blob gets bigger, the file system has an advantage, but as the size of the blob is smaller than about 10K, the database is actually faster. So it, it, it's not a sluggard. It, it actually does a pretty good job. Uh, SQLite's different from all the other database engines. We've got MySQL here, or Mar MariaDB, Postgres. All of these others are kind of designed to run in a data center. And whereas SQLite runs out on the edge of the network uh, in IOC, and in, in IoT devices and that sort of thing. It is not a separate process. It's not a separate thread. SQLite is a subroutine. There's, no, there's nothing running in the background to take care of background processes. 
And so it's a very different sort of thing. And you can have multiple processes access, accessing the same database at the same time. We can't use direct I.O., or we could, but it wouldn't make sense to use direct I.O. for that because you've got multiple, you know, there's multiple applications that are reading the same file and they, they're not coordinating their buffers. So we're, we're kind of dependent upon the operating system's buffer cache to take care of that for us. Uh, the an SQLite database is a single file on disk, uh, possibly with um, some journal files to control uh, 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 the atomic uh, commit capability. And uh, there, but but we have no there's no configuration file. There's nothing that we can do to say, oh, this is a uh, this is we're running on a particular file system that has these capabilities. We have to discover all of that at runtime, and, and, and we would really like to have capabilities to discover more because there's a lot of things that we'd like to know. Um, uh, of course, in any database, it's important to be ACID, atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. And we, there's three ways we implement that in SQLite. Uh, the default method is slow. It's a rollback journal, but it's default because it, run, it works anywhere. Now, if we know that we're not running on a network file system, we can do a write-ahead log and that's faster, but it also requires some shared memory. And if we're on a, a network file system, we can't have shared memory between all the, the users because we could have different users on different machines that were ac accessing the database at the same time. No, I don't mind if you change it to the different display at all. So, um, but we don't have a good, a good way to determine if we're on a network file system or not. So we kind of have to default to the slower method. Um, so you know, if, if we had a, a way to do that, that would be really cool. I'll stop while we talk. Well, I'll keep going. Yeah, it's just a library. Yeah. So if we just had a, a what? Yeah. Well, I mean, if we we could, and we could maintain a database of what's a network file system, and what isn't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, right. I mean, it, that means that we'd have to, and see, a lot of times the SQLite is statically linked with the application. And so if we were trying to keep a list of this and somebody statically linked it, there's no way for us to upgrade that for them. Yeah. So it would be nice if we had a way to just ask if this is a network file mm -hmm. system or not. Uh, we also have the ability to, do, to, to make use of the atomic write capabilities that are in F2FS. And I was going to say a lot about that, and I was going to, and, and to my surprise, during the break, the author of F2FS, uh, Jay Gook Kim, pre presented himself. <laughs> I did not know he was here at the conference. But, uh, well, this is a really cool thing. It only works on Linux. Uh, it's really fast. Uh, what the, the anecdotal reports I've received are that if you take an old Android phone that used to be running ext4 and you reflash it to use F2FS, it suddenly starts seeming like a perky new phone. It, it makes a significant difference. And um, so, you know, if, if there were some way to, to if, and the way we interface with that right now is there's a bunch of goofy IOCTLs that we have to call to check to see if, this, if, the, if the device is capable of it and then to control the transactions. But it really would be nice if there was a, a, a generic way to do this uh, with any file system that supported it. Um, other things to discuss, yeah, we, we really like reliable ways to discover properties of the file system. An example is um, uh, when, when you create a new file on disk and you write to it and f-sync it, do you also need to open the directory that contains that file and f-sync that directory to make sure that the file doesn't end up in lost and found after a power loss? And is that a, is, is that a file system dependent thing or is it always true that we have to do that or you know, what's the answer to that? Right now we assume that you have to do that and we're, we're actually opening the directory and we're f-syncing the directory after any time we create a file. But if we could avoid doing that, it would be really cool and it would, things would go faster. No, I'm just going to ask, did you have any information, any hints that made you think that it might be mm -hmm. file system dependent, that you don't have to do that? I don't know, because maybe uh, with you know, journaling modes or you know, mount options or something, that it would just work. I don't know. I'm user space. Am I out of time already? Have already used my five minutes? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so, like, yes, Jan. Or we can take it offline, but yeah, yes. you, 
Yeah, probably. That, if you yeah, let's just take it offline. I've got a whole list of things. And then, of course, the FBA that we talked about before. And, you know, an idea of, you know, a lot of times we have big holes in the file where we, it's places we don't care about. And we could tell the operating system, hey, this big chunk of, of, of 64K, we don't care about. You can make it a hole in the file system where no allocated space and you can return zeros. We don't care. Would that be useful to the file system? If so, we need a way to tell the file system about that hole. And so, in summary, here's the resources. There's a briefing paper there with <laughs> about two hours worth of, of discussion topics. And uh, that's how you get in touch with me. And we should really stay in touch so that uh, you know, SQLite has always worked really, really well on Linux. Let's work together to keep it that way. Questions or should we go on immediately to the next talk? Yeah, yeah, just the ability to get detailed FS capabilities. And I've, I've get specific well, questions in the briefing paper. So, so, so the thing is that file systems, so, so there is POSIX, which basically mandates that you have to call FSync on the directory, right? Yeah. yeah. And generally, file system developers do not want to give you more, more uh, guarantees because it ties their hands. Yeah, sure. And so, because there are other people who are, you know, pushing the other way around, you know, like <laughs> give me maximum performance and I don't care about all these like details of consistency. I can deal with that myself. Yeah. So, so, so currently we are kind of middle ground. So we promise what the post mandates and so, so you are required to have sync the directory. On the other hand, the file system somehow magically made sure for example, in XT 4 k we do have sync for you, in fact, under the hood, because there is lots of broken applications sure. that wouldn't <laughs> work otherwise. Uh, and But the second f sync you will issue if you are a good guy is going to be pretty cheap. Because we already record when we have our last like, f sync and we see, oh, there is nothing, nothing okay. to do, just bail out. So the second f sync is going to be pretty cheap to Other do. questions are like if there's concurrent activity. Yeah, yeah, if there is no concurrent activity. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is the sort of thing I need to hear. I need authoritatively from, from people like you who know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there, is there a way to detect if we need a sync or not within the SQL? Sorry? Is there a way to detect that from the application? No. No. No way to detect and we don't want to give you a way. <laughs> 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 because that would kind of support the brokenness, yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, not so long ago there was a patch on like FS info um, exposing that. I don't think it's been merged, but that that at least exposed if there was an it was a network <laughs> file system. Um, it was in that spec. Is <laughs> how much do you want to extend it? <laughs> Sorry. Just quickly, I think. Fallocate can, um, uh, well, there's a Fallocate call which can actually dig holes in files and send it or give the file system that a hint that actually that you don't care about that data anymore. I don't know whether you necessarily want to do that because it may have ramifications if you ever need to do I.O. to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would have ultimately want to write to it again in the future. Yeah. And at that point, yeah, I want you to fill it back in. It's just that, like I said, right now I don't need it. Okay. And I, it, it, I didn't know if it might be useful to the file system or not. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, but, it, it, but it is useful because then the file system can start doing trims on those blocks instead of having to keep them maintained in the in Sure, the but but if it's not a, not a flash file system, if it I'm, I'm saying there are cases actually yeah, right. I guess SSDs. Um, yeah, SSDs. SSDs trim happily right, too. SSDs. It's, but if it's like um, you know, EXT4 with extents and stuff, you don't want to be punching a whole bunch of holes in it because so I guess it would be the file system independent thing. How do I know? <laughs> yeah, I guess it doesn't pay off really. Like, you don't think it's worth doing? No, I don't think it's worth doing. So what file system could do conceivably is to, it could mark blocks as unwritten. So basically saying these blocks have unknown contents. So 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 analog. So <laughs> if the file system like punching holes is one option for this, yeah. But yeah. then that's really expensive because you have to free blocks and when yeah. you reuse, you have to allocate blocks. It fragments the file. It fragments the extent tree. Uh, 
really performance down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But performance is going to be down. Uh, what cheaper way would be to just mark the extents as unwritten. So basically, we don't know the contents. Yeah, that'd be and fine. when it, when you write to it, we just mark them as written again. That's sure. that's much cheaper. And is it useful? That's the question. But the question is like, what would you get from it? Because the space is still allocated, so so like from file system point of view, there is no advantage. You could trim, but honestly, given the state of trim with current devices, it's not worth it either. Okay. <laughs> like unless you are trimming gigabytes, it's not worth it. Okay. Uh, All right. That's wonderful information. This is exactly what I'm looking for. I have about a dozen other questions like this on the briefing paper. Yeah. <laughs> Please hunt me up and tell me these things. <laughs> We're going to move on to the next talk. Yeah, be with the handheld. I don't see it changing to the new feature there. Like later, it can, but. Trim is one of those cases that I don't always think so well. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a problem with this uh, my computer not recognizing it, but so I can just talk, start talking without that. Um, I don't know what to do right now about it. Uh, what I was want to complain about is that uh, at the moment it's very the durability situation around Postgres is very uh, around Linux is very hard. Uh, every different file system has different behavior, and the general error handling behavior is just not documented. Let me just send him the slide so it's perhaps easier. My one pr big problem is that basically all syscalls don't document what happens in error case. Some of them have started to add some minimal documentation, but usually it's either incorrect or out of date. Like fsync doesn't even have any documentation what kind of errors uh, can happen. And I think that makes it really hard for uh, user space applications to actually write correct code. And I think that's also one reason why you see all these applications doing different things for durability because there's no documentation what you're supposed to do. And the POSIX yeah. guarantees are completely vague. Yeah. Like, there's no way that exactly. everyone is per interpreting the so, same way. So that's exactly where, where this came from. Yeah. The thing is that the standards basically define what should happen when, when things are normal. And then the standards even don't quite define the F-Sync semantics. Yeah. Because it's like durability and stuff like that is very like out of what POSIX tries to define. Right. So even less the error handling, like when the hardware does something out of ordinary. So that's where there is no standardization and that's where everything has grown kind of ad hoc. 
but then I think Linux should start have like some documentation oh, that says I share your pain for <laughs> <laughs> at the very least you need to do these and these steps and they might be unnecessary for, for some file systems but if so you're on your own and you better read the kernel code even if like that seems to be the absolute minimum for to get anywhere and a second related problem is that even if a lot of the durability operations that are very important to get good performance on, post, uh, on Linux are like com have like warnings like this, which basically says, never ever use this, but when we complain about performance, they say, use this. Like sync file range, this documentation literally says, it, this system call is extremely dangerous and should not be used in portable programs. I mean, the portable program part, okay, I get that because it's Linux specific, but it's the answer to a lot of, solving a lot of performance problems, but it's extremely dangerous, like, you gotta make a call which one you mean at some point. Yeah, so probably it should be rephrased, like, because, so the warning is there because uh, it is really no, not useful for achieving any kind of durability or data integrity, yeah. It's really useful for early flushing of data, just as a kind of, it can be considered a hint to the kernel that maybe it should do something. Like in practice, it happens. Uh, in practice, the kernel will do something, but the durability is not really guaranteed after this, this is called complete. And that's why there is this big fat warning because we don't want to deal with users who use this and say, oh, where's my data, you know? Right, right, <laughs> but like at the same time, you provided it for a reason. And like, how are you supposed to actually use it safely without reading the kernel code? And like, that just seems like I agree with rephrasing, yeah. <laughs> and one other very big problem is that the error behavior between different parts of Linux are, is completely different. Depending on which file system you need, uh, use, you get either the old version after an error of the page after an error, or the new version after, of a page after an error. Do, if, you, if it's NFS, you might not see the error at all because it will be happen at close. Like, there needs to be some documentation of what users can expect and what users need to be checking because otherwise it's will never like you can't really complain about people writing crappy code if you if that's all the guidance people have and I think it's really problematic for user space developers and it also makes your life ha harder because then we do something and then you afterwards complain how did you get the idea that that was a safe idea thing to do but it's the only way we can we can, we can only guess and like interpret the results from other operating systems or from Linux 2.6 or whatever. But how deep do you want that to go? I mean, the, the file system implementers are, are hampered by what the block drivers give them. The block drivers are hampered by what the device actually implements and the device semantics vary so much. So how deep can you try and assemble complete behavior? I mean, I don't think it has to be complete behavior. And I think you can really expect the block driver to fix uh, uh, or the block layer to fix that a device is lying to you about its drive cache. I mean, there's no way the Linux can fix that really, except having like an endless blacklist or something. So that part I don't really, I don't blame Linux for that. But saying that, hey, if you want that durability guarantee, you need to do this operation and then all the file systems behave in a similar way and that the block layer will return errors in a consistent way instead of like right now you get a completely different error if there's a thin provisioning target below it, all the guarantees are off and you get like Eno spaces from random operation that aren't <laughs> returning Eno space by documentation. So, so let's, let's take it's the read. really just hard for Let's take the read us. after write issue. Uh, presuming, presuming you understood that the write cache is turned on or turned off and that it's actually gonna go to the media and the power goes off. Once upon a time, people believed that there was enough juice for it to finish writing the sector. There isn't anymore. Um, you know, so halfway through a sector, the power goes off, that sector is, has been written off now. The next time you read it, there's going to be an error. That's true for ro some rotating media. Um, it's not true for SSDs, it's not true for flash, it's not true for networking file systems. So the varying device semantics are going to make a, a particular guarantee very hard to make. I mean, that part is, is problematic, but I think that's really not the kind of guarantee I'm looking for. What I'm thinking more more is that hey, if you get an error about F, uh, from fsync, what happens if you retry the f uh, the fsync? Will it actually retry the data right, or will it just throw away the data? It's the latter kind of somewhat in the moment, but like that's not documented anywhere except if you read some LKML so, so uh, you're, discussions, you're and that kind of thing needs to be documented in my opinion. 
So you're looking for documented failure semantics, which is the place that POSIX is really weak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, and I think the other side of that coin is documented ways to do things in a safe manner. Because like that's also just a guessing game right now. We're talking to kernel developers over beer, which is <laughs> nice, but <laughs> hard to do remotely. I mean, that's this part here where there's no guidance how to write safe code that is durable. And whatever you do, somebody will complain. If you complain about performance, somebody will complain that we do uh, too much. If we complain about data loss, somebody will complain that we don't do enough. And the opinions will like contradict each other wildly. And that also then leads to like you not being able to write code that is performant because we all have, all applications have different uh, performance characteristics depending on what kind of solution we implemented. And the one extreme example is by the definition of some, or what the documented opinions of by some file system developers, that's what you kind of need to do to do a safe re atomic rename. And that's like kind of insane. And, but is it the right way? I mean, like you can't really interpret it out of POSIX what exactly you need to do, at least not by my reading. I try to reason about the standard there. I don't know whether that is the right thing to do, but it's what POSIX now does forever for everything. But it's like hard to precisely and if it's required, then please document that somewhere. Why would, why would you do that? Because otherwise, depending on the file system, you actually lose uh, the file or they'll get the old file name back or something. Well, I think the fsync new file maybe is not needed here. But why, why do you miss the fsync old? Because otherwise, yeah. you, the, the file directory might not be under the old name safely. I mean, this behavior is actually based on like actual testing of, of crashes of the database, right? So, so we, we've been actually uh, doing power loss tests on, on the code and this is the thing that actually finally fixed that. Uh, <laughs> so, so, I mean like, is it really needed? I mean like, I don't know. Um, it, it works on an EXT4, uh, it, it works on XFS, does it work on other file systems? Um, I don't know, I mean like, but it, it finally made the data loss go away, right? So, so we, that, that's, that's the main reason why we do that. I mean. Right here, you might have written this that the loss of service stuff is not doing this, right? So, by just trying to do the best to automate the work somehow. But I mean, like. Somehow those two things. I mean, there has. It's also what, like, it makes some sense that you need to have the for an atomic rename that you need the old content to be durable before you can rely on either seeing either the before state or the after state. Um, so that's why you need to. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess what would be good, so I, I I completely agree that we are lacking any documentation in this sense. Uh, and I guess file system people would be willing to kind of improve the situation. Uh, but uh, like maybe could you come up with a concrete question like you have, you know, what do I need to consistently create a file, a, a file in a directory? What I, what can I, what need I do to do atomic renaming? Now, what happens when there is I.O. error during F-Sync, you know, am I getting the I.O. errors consistently? What will happen with the data? What guarantees are you willing to give me? And bring this up on FS Devel mailing list. And like we could, I, I, I guess. Oh, I think that because you went ahead and answered my question by saying it. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and we could take it from there and probably create a file in kernel's documentation directory, at least initially, that's probably the most easy, where we would document at least the guarantees we are willing to give. And for example, yeah, stuff like how do I, how the hell do I re reliably create a file is a good question, and I guess any file system developer, like, what you have is probably what you need to do. That, that's good. With the rename, it's kind of sad. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> I, I, I guess there would be fastest, other fastest ten people as well interested in digging why so much is needed because, like, I, I at least one of the F things for ext4 and XFS I don't think should be needed, but maybe I even I as guy who writes this stuff wrote this stuff miss something. So, uh, I mean, the F sync old file stuff is only needed in the case you haven't previously f synced it under that file name. And the only reason we need to do that is because we do some of that during crash recovery where we can't guarantee that we previously f synced it. So if you, you can really- Yeah, but it's a but fair question, yeah. So yeah, like if you bring these concrete questions and you know, could, we can create a document uh, which will kind of at least answer some of these. Can you tell me again exactly which mailing list do we send these concrete questions to? Yes, sure. Linux FS Devel. Yeah. FS Devel at VCR kernel org. Yeah, that's the standard host. But Did you have a concrete list of operations that you already identified? I mean, I can come up with one fairly easily. Yeah, if you can it's come like together with a sensible list of questions, that's, that's great. Because like we as file system developers, for us, a lot of things is kind of obvious. And we don't have, we don't have to yeah. Oops. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of miss the questions because it's yeah, so obvious. yeah, it's obvious to us and we even don't think about these questions, you know, like, like we think really very low level at kind of like what this is called should guarantee but you know already like what the use what the use use user needs to do to actually make this like useful operation for the application that obviously set off several system calls usually and then what's the overall semantics is kind of unobvious so and we, we are not used to usually we don't think that high <laughs> okay i'll try to propose a list of questions and CCU uh, or somebody. So, so two two questions for you. Um, so one, are you looking to get kind of like the lowest common denominator of calls that you would need? Because obviously, file, different file systems are going to behave differently. Some of them may not require that same incantation. Are you looking for kind of like worst case scenario? That's what you want. So, even if you're running on a different file system, yeah, you might be doing extra operations. Uh, that are unnecessary for that file system, but you're going to do them just because. Yes, basically. I mean, okay. if there is a too large performance penalty, it's possible that you would ha do something file system dependent, but because all of this changes over the years so much, and yeah. we so constantly run on old uh, kernel versions, kernel versions with a lot of backports, it's just, in my opinion, unfeasible to so maintain that in everything, except for the, maybe the most extreme performance regressions. So I really want to have a common denominator and then also ensure by that that new file systems have somewhere where they can align their semantics to. Because one problem is that if somebody writes a new file system, they just come up with their semantics from like scratch. And that usually means that they're completely broken. And then somebody <laughs> reports the obvious bug and then that got fixed and then all the unobvious bugs comes out over the next 10 years. And the, the, the second question I had is uh, assuming a world where you got what you wanted from F-Sync. You got an error condition. Can you gracefully recover from that? Yeah, we can do crash recovery and just re restart the database, replay from the journal, and go from there. Because obviously the, the, the failure for F-Sync could vary. I mean, it could be like, hey, the disk I was going to is gone and is never coming back. I mean, in that case, obviously you can't really like, recover, like, recover because there's no data to, to recover. But <laughs> it at least allows us to uh, like in the transient case, which actually is these days pretty common due to like network issues and so on, we can safely recover. And in other cases, the database crashes and doesn't come up, and then you can do automated failover. So that allows that too. But like okay. not being able to detect them, the failures that actually occur, makes it worse because the database will still stay up, lose data, and nobody will be the wiser. And yeah. that part actually leads into the first part that at the moment we don't have a way to. Det uh, like detect what kind of failures we're running into. Because you can get an I.O. error and you don't know whether it is transient. You don't know whether there will be an I.O. error somewhere else on the uh, file system. Even if we just had something like 
if you do this uh, stat FS or something and get an error count that we can monitor to say, hey, has this error count increased? And if it has increased, you can shut down or something. Even that would be a huge progress because at the moment, basically failover solutions, have, what they have to do is to build like lock scraping facilities that uh, monitor the kernel uh, output and try to parse whether those are fatal issues, which is really hard because like sometimes you'll get ATA reset messages that are completely harmless and sometimes they mean everything's bad. Like, which, like, that can't be a sensible approach that every site implements their own kernel lock parser and heuristics to detect whether there's something bad. And I think there we, Linux need to, need to provide something that allows applications to determine that. There are ways to get it from disks. There's no way to find out what happened on the other end of a network connection. Um, flashes, at least the ones that are doing SATA or SAS emulation, you can get information. Um, getting it from the file system is gonna be hard because file systems don't typically deal with things like smart data. They don't deal with the ability to identify what devices they're being laid out on without you doing some ex cathedra inspection. So there is information available from devices figuring out how to get to the device and get the information, and more importantly, whether it's recoverable. You know, SATA drives go offline. Until you cycle power, they're not gonna come back. Is that recoverable or isn't it? I mean, I don't, if that kind of error, I don't really care whether it's recoverable because that will involve an admin anyway. So if I mark it as non-recoverable, like if I treat it as a non-recoverable error, it's completely fine. The only case where I want to know whether I can just retry, like the important thing is whether I know just retrying the write or the f-sync, whether that has a success, chance of success, that is somewhat important, because then I... So, so you'd like the e-hopeful error return? <laughs> Say again? You'd like the e-hopeful error return? Like, Kinda, I, instead but like of, even... Instead of something went wrong and we can't tell you anymore, it's... Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah. it's more complete, like it's not just that, like, I mean, even if it's just EIO, knowing that there has been an EIO to an application on the same drive, that isn't my process is really important because like there's hot backup programs and if the hot backup program uh, encountered the error, I don't I won't see that as the database so, anymore. So and what, that I need to be able to as a database to see hey something has been concurrent bug uh, like data corruption so, issues. So just like a sig seg v gives you some more information about the type of fault and maybe some information about where the fault was, you're looking for more information on I O errors in particular. Yeah, I don't need to, to know whether it was on block 17 or whether it was a, I can't remap or anymore or whatever. <laughs> so, just what kind of, so what kind of error you can get from a thing that, what, ki what kind of error could happen that you get from a thing that you decide, okay, now I, ca I can try to repeat the right? I mean, and like some operating systems just allow you to retry the F, F sync and the data will yes. that it will work. That's y one thing. Yes, you can retry after any error, but in what case you can retry even if the disk was gone? But in what no, so, it in what case it will make it will throw data away. Yes, yes, I know. You, you can still you can still retry in a loop. I mean, you you can retry, but I after what error it makes sense to retry that, hoping that it will succeed. I mean, I'm more interested in that there has been an error that I that didn't wasn't ca caught by Postgres because I won't be able to see errors that are called by other applications? Yes, so my, my question is, can you, can I, an example, exa with example of an error after which it makes sense to try hoping for a success? Or the only, or no matter what the error, the best thing you can do is to crash and then just I mean, recover. If, the network, if it's a transient network issue, then it can't, and the kernel handles that in a way that is retriable, that's, that would be relevant, because that happens. Yeah, but that, then it, it should be handled, not by you, by the kernel there. Yeah, um, so, so, so I think Hi. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a tool we've uh, implemented at MongoDB, and we're just trying to look for feedback here on how uh, and if it could be useful um, for you as well. So I'm going to talk about the goals and the profiler. I'm just going to show a screenshot of the profiler first, then a quick uh, quick look at the uh, design. Uh, I'm going to cover an example, and then like to get some feedback from you. 
Right, the goal. Uh, the goal intersects actually our pain point, which is uh, the fact that we would like to see a 100% um, thread profile of our server, our MongoDB server. And we also want to see it in a time variant way, as opposed to, for example, the, the standard um, uh, on CPU analysis tools like Perf or uh, off CPU analysis, which is uh, now part of the BPF tools and it's on Brendan Gregg's uh, on homepage as well. Um, that would give us a information for a, like for example, a 10 second, 20 second static view. Um, we're trying to catch, cap, uh, to catch transient sporadic events that happen, for example, over a long time. So uh, we want to get something dynamic, for example, sampled every one second. Um, one use case here is a customer, for example, that comes back to us and says, uh, I had a performance issue um, that happens uh, once a day or once every three days and lasts 10 seconds. So instead of rushing it every time the, uh, the problem happens or overly instrumenting the server, uh, we want to have something that's low overhead with low data generation uh, that can capture all the information we need to start our analysis and then analyze it after the fact. Um, this is what the profiler looks like. And really, the thread profile section is what we're talking about. Um, not sure if it reads well out from out there. Um, we also have a top section, it's called server status here, that covers some, covers some metrics. Uh, we actually have hundreds of service status um, diagnostic data metrics. And they are built-in metrics that we instrument the server uh, to get some diagnostic information to help us resolve uh, the performance issues that we see. Um, the reason why we like the thread profiler is that um, it can give us uh, even uh, more insight on what's, going, come, what's happening on the server. And this goes beyond what we already instrument and gives us also a view on what happens at the kernel level. Now, a quick view at this. This is just a um, really a synthetic example. Um, from time A, we see a drop in the, uh, in the throughput, right? And this is a command throughput. Anyway, it means that this, there probably is a um, performance issue. Um, the thread profile view, and I really cut this because it tends to be quite verbose. Um, in this case, it shows that some uh, wire target eviction threads are going from sleeping, so four threads sleeping. And by the way, the blue line means that the threads are off CPU. Um, and then from time A, uh, the performance degradation correlates with uh, more activity in, um, in eviction threads. Now you see blue and red. Uh, the blue is the off CPU, uh, the off CPU time. The red is the sampled on CPU time. This is a call. Uh, this is a call three. So the ancestor is uh, the caller, and then it goes down to the leaf, and then you can see that um, for uh, for call threads, ultimately it gets uh, back to the scheduler. Now, um, just a quick view at the design. Uh, it's conceptually very simple. Uh, it uses two uh, K probes, schedule and finish that switch. They're marked blue because that's uh, off CPU. It basically tracks the time that when a thread goes off CPU, which is schedule, it's been scheduled back on the waiting queue, and finish task, which, which is the time when it's due back on CPU. We have this perf sample event, uh, which samples um, um, on CPU threads, stack traces uh, every once in a while. I, it's, this is really, this side is similar to uh, what Perf Record already does. And we have an eBPF program that does the aggregation at sorts. So it does it very, uh, quite efficiently and then uh, pumps a Perf ring buffer for the user space side of the, uh, of the profiler to gather this information, sample uh, it every one second and emit the stack traces. So we get the profiling data. Um, now, this is, pretty useful uh, because it will help us um, understand and characterize a problem where um, there is CPU saturation, for example, but also, and perhaps more importantly, 
um, to understand when a um, and characterize a problem that is caused by uh, off CPU, so uh, time spent elsewhere. For example, on uh, um, on mutex contention, so uh, poor um, poor concurrency, for example, or uh, something that's bound by uh, something like the I the I/O interconnect or uh, the storage. And here's a practical example. Um, so I reproduced a stall that we see uh, on the XT4 with very slow storage. And by very slow storage here, uh, I actually mean a storage whose uh, throughput capacity, sorry, um, a workload uh, whose, um, the, where the amount of dirty data exceeds the storage capacity to flush it. Um, I made this example very explicit. I mean, I, uh, and, and dramatic as well, so I put a workload that really exceeds the capacity. Um, so what we see here with our um, instrumentation, the diagnostic data that's, that already exists uh, is really a gap, right? Uh, from A to C, so for about three minutes, um, we get no information. So in this case, uh, yeah, we, we probably have some other cloud monitoring tools that will give us um, some more diagnostic information, but uh, from this specialized standpoint, uh, we have a gap. Um, we, we also know this is a YSCSB workload that uh, externally, by checking the throughput, uh, the actual operational style happens from B to C, so this side here. And here, it's just likely that um, our thread that collects all the metrics has somehow stalled, right? So enter the thread profiler here. Now, I, I've been here just cutting and pasting um, some, um, so chopping up the, uh, the thread profiler output just to make uh, the interpretation easier, because otherwise it's quite verbose. Um, anyway, what we can see here, um, and I'm not sure if you can read it um, over there, but uh, there is our checkpoint thread that is doing uh, quite unsurprisingly an F data sync. So the F data sync starts slightly before A, so slightly before the issue, and it ends just by the end of it, so point C. Um, let's see what, what's happening on other threads. Now, uh, at the time where our metrics stall, um, we see that a call trace that is doing a, is calling to the open system call, um, is somehow waiting on the journal, right? And the ext4 journal, jbd2, and I um, mark that over there. Uh, there is something more over there that um, just below in the, uh, in the stack frame that says, that we're actually blocking on ad transaction credits. We'll get to there in a second. Um, right, now, something that happens before the, uh, the actual operational stall. Um, we see that one wire tiger thread, uh, that's eviction thread, is doing a write system call, right? It, that means that probably it's evicting a, a page that was found to be dirty, so, it's writing that back. Um, again, the eviction seems to, uh, the thread that's doing the eviction seems to go off CPU for the duration of the F sync. Again, uh, the ext4 journal seems to be related to this. Finally, uh, the operational stall. We look at the uh, uh, thread that's performing the, the operation, that's an update operation. And if we dig down, it's actually trying to page in a, um, some data at the wire tiger level. And for some reason, uh, it's unable to. And in fact, the, uh, the source, um, the, uh, the actual symbolized stack trace says that we're spinning. Uh, we're actually spinning with a back off. So we're spending most of the time off CPU on libc select. And the most likely reason for this stall is that this point four is, depends on three, where that very page was being evicted, and now it's spending on the ext4 journal. So, 
What this means um, is really that we've reconstructed a timeline of the issue. Uh, we probably haven't root caused it, but now we characterize how the system degrades as, um, as the problem uh, keeps mounting up. Um, I am by no means a, uh, an EXT4 expert. However, by looking at the documentation, I see that the JBD2 journal start call can actually and will indeed sleep if we're overcommitting the journal buffer. So in this case, with all this, all this in mind, my theory is that um, the F data sync is causing a lot of um, uh, of write activity, that's again uh, saturating the uh, the storage, and this is somehow uh, impairing the ability of the journal to commit and flush the data off its buffer. So this over commissioning, uh, it's causing the um, wire tiger eviction to stall. This is a pretty simple example. It's not surprising. I mean, we we're operating um, with. Um, we're pretty much using more resources than, than the specs of the machine, right? Um, so, yeah, I'd like to wrap up on this. Uh, we, we find this uh, to be a very promising tool. Um, our plan is to, well, validate this at scale because we, we'd like to get the, um, um, to make sure that the performance impact here is kept within reasonable bounds and we're aiming at somewhere around uh, up to 5% performance impact on CPU bound workloads. Um, that's it, yeah, off, off CPU analysis can, um, can help explain a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, I, I'm positive that can probably give some, some input on, uh, uh, on the issue we were talking about earlier on where um, XFS seems to be faster, seems to be slower when you do um, like the norm, like a um, like a number of writes, and it happens to be faster when to these writes you also add a sort of synthetic bogus write, and that doesn't really add up. Um, so my hunch is that probably with approach like this, uh, you can you can figure out uh, how the uh, ext4 or the block device or whatever is downstream. Um, in terms of uh, the, the kernel side, it's spending its time both on and off CPU. And this is something we, we cannot see uh, very easily doing uh, like a perf record or with traditional methods like uh, GDB stack traces, um, sorry, so GDB sampling. Um, you would get a, uh, an overhead that will probably change the overall shape. No, at least not at the moment. Um, fundamentally, it's, it's very simple to implement, really. Uh, we just shoehorned uh, the off-CPU off analysis tool that Brendan Gregg has. And uh, yeah, we added a sampler. You know, instead of putting, aggregating all this data and outputting that at the very end, do that same task once a second. So do you plan to open source it? or? I don't know. Uh, at, th at this stage, we're really trying to validate it and understand if this works well with all the workloads for a sustained amount of time. Um, probably, yeah. We haven't thought about this yet. So I guess it's a good start, yeah. Uh, like, of course, one of the useful information, like you could, like for example, what is very difficult to debug in cases like this is you have some process blocked on select because it has actually offloaded some work to another process and is now waiting for the result. And this is very difficult to trace through. So, so such a debug tool 
it would be very useful if in the debug tool you could see actually how the file descriptors of different processes are linked so that if select weights somewhere you could actually efficiently find out which are the other processes it is waiting on. So like a dependency chain basically, right? Yeah. So understand straight away who's the victim and yeah. uh, what's the cause. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point actually. Because uh, probably one, one of the possible drawbacks, uh, which we see in general with off CPU analysis, and this tool is no exception, is that the output is quite verbose. Yeah. So most of the time, the first approach you want to do is pattern matching. You know, when, when this issue uh, occurs during this time frame, um, what are the thread profiles that stick out, right? But um, even in that case, there's a lot of, you know, it's initially some guesswork, so you have to lay out some hypothesis. Then what we ideally mentally do is um, uh, we use kernel instrumentation, like BPF trace as an example, right? Uh, but ideally, uh, if we had some information as to what caused what, right, maybe some, say, scenarios that point uh, to events, that, that would be ideal. Uh, we're, we're not there yet. No. <laughs> Anyway, um, Powell, um, yep. up to you. Okay, I'm Pavel Hava from the Oracle, and I made some changes to the read log in my SQL, <coughs> which I wanted to shortly present and then uh, tell about the uh, things that I looking for and for answers or some help. So basically, the new read log uh, is consists of two, two changes, major changes, that were uh, applied to the previous redo log we had in the MySQL. The first thing is that uh, previously we had this log system mutex which protected uh, and serialized the writes to the redo log, to the redo log buffer. So the, it was all protected by the mutex and, and caused the contention on the log system mutex which was easily visible via our uh, monitoring uh, counters which we use to, to, to detect where is the contention, uh, especially for uh, OLTP high workload. Uh, the second part of the changes is related to the background threads which we introduced, which uh, take care of writing the redo log from the log buffer to this, uh, to the file system cache, and from there doing the F-Syncs to, to get finally some durability. And of course, uh, there are, there is a the last need that we need, uh, the last problem that we have to solve, to be solved, uh, that we had to solve, it was to uh, effectively wait on the read of being written or flushed during the transaction commit. So uh, just to shortly describe what was there. So previously there was a mutex. All the threads were uh, fighting for the mutex and one that acquired could write to the log buffer and then it exchanged the mutex for the other mutex to do other part but uh, still, before he finished, the next one could not acquire this mutex, so it was just waiting here, and then the next one was waiting here, so the contention was basically around this log system mutex here. And currently what we did is that we eliminated the log system mutex, and we allowed all the threads to concurrently write to the log buffer, and then in a, they can do this thing, this stage in a different uh, time, so they can interleave with each other, and, uh, and then they start adding the dirty pages to the flush lists, which is uh, which must be preceded with the write to the read log, because uh, when you add, I mean, okay, this is the everything I will describe. This is the mini transaction commit, which is related to the operation when you want to atomically modify some dirty pages for which you need to first write a headlock and then ensure that the, the pages are ready to flush list. So before they are f uh, flushed, you have the, the read lock uh, in the place. So how did we relax this order? Because uh, for some reason it was important. Yes, it was important. And what we did was that we allowed, of course, to do these concurrent operations in parallel so they can be finished in different order order the different order in which they started 
But then we allow just a limited size of the window for depending operations which are not finished. And each operation which ap after it's finished reports that it's finished. So we can track up to which point all the operations finally are finished. So this is basically the idea that instead of doing things uh, in a serialized way, we can do things in parallel, uh, not taking care about the order in which they are finished, but just everybody who is doing such stuff in parallel needs to report when, it, when he finished. So this allows us to order uh, the mini transaction commits, how they happen, a little bit differently if you look on how time progresses and how LSN value progresses. LSN is the sequence number which is increased every time you write to the read lock. So finally they can be a little bit the order is a little bit uh, relaxed, so yeah, they can happen in any order, you can think, but uh, if you look at the constraints, you will notice that the order is not as much relaxed as, uh, as you previously might think, because we allowed threads just to do things in any order. Uh, the, the point is that the limited window of the pending operations, which are still not finished, this limitation allows us to have a guarantee that the destruction of the order is not that much. But to track which, uh, to track which, uh, which uh, concurrent tasks have been finished, we need to have a special data structure which is implemented as a log-free cyclic array. And in that array we have all the tasks that are finished being reported. And the background thread needs to basically track uh, up to which point all the concurrent tasks have been finished. So the first problem we have uh, here is does this background thread, which for example is writing also the redo log, so it knows up to which point the redo log buffer is filled in, even though the concurrent threads can fill the log buffer uh, in different fragments concurrently, but they do report when they finish their parts. So because of this reported uh, knowledge, the background thread can this easily uh, track how much of the redo is already prepared and do the next write. But uh, after we, we moved the job of writing the redo log to the dedicated thread, uh, there is a problem with waiting on the job to be uh, on the next job to be done. So, for instance. Uh, the redo log thread needs to wait uh, for the user threads to provide him next data to be written to the disk. So if we just follow the very basic idea that we can just wait on the event, I mean on the conditional variable and just uh, wake up the writer thread when the next data arrived, this introduces a very huge uh, latency issue because waking up takes some time and it goes through when the, when the, when if the log writer was uh, waiting in the wait queue, then you need to wait, and you, and you wanted to wake up, it, it will not be that instant, and in comparison, if you just do the spin loop and let him just wait actively during the busy, busy wait, then it can just uh, uh, start, straight, uh, start as soon as the data arrived to the log buffer. So. Basically, we had to <coughs> introduce some kind of strategy for waiting. And the strategy we introduced was that uh, the threads start with the spin loop because if, 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 uh, if, 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 if the data is expected to be soon, th this will be uh, the, the, the most efficient way. But after some limit is reached, we switch to the waiting on the condition variable with a minimum timeout value so in this case, we could be woken up by any thread that wanted us, for example, to write the redo log to disk. And each time uh, the timeout is uh, small, so even if there is no uh, re reason to write the log buffer to disk, we can just retry to see if there is anything we can proceed with. So. Uh, we wake up on the small timeout, but then if nothing happens and the server is idle, it would waste a lot of CPU time. So basically every few waits, we increase the timeout, like multiply it by two, uh, to find the proper uh, mechanism 
which balances between uh, how the latency is slow, decreased, and how the CPU is being uh, used too much. So the, the questions we have, we have here is how to do this adaptive weighting a better way, because this is just the approach we come up with after we noticed that the spinning is uh, helping us a lot, but on the other hand, we didn't want to waste CPU time on spinning in case of idle workloads or workloads that don't need it that much. Uh, so the question is if we could just let know scheduler about some critical periods of execution, for example. So if the mini transaction commit is going on, we could hint that this is not the fragment in which we would, be, we would like to be preempted because in such case, the uh, the would be a hole in the sequence of LSN values which would be not filled in the log buffer and everybody else would stay unhappy because of that. So if we could force a proper scheduling for threads following the, 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 this, the, the pattern I described that we create task, do some work and report the task is done uh, for these threads because we know what is the order that should be uh, that should be ideal in a situation. If we wanted to schedule the threads ourselves, we would know how to do it, but the scheduler has no idea about what, what order he should select. So ba basically, if we could just hint the scheduler uh, that there is some particular order, the order in which we should do it, it would help us. So the other point is that uh, if the log writer is actively waiting for the data to be delivered and there are multiple uh, user threads, it would make sense to wake up a proper user thread which probably could be, for example, uh, preempted too quickly. So there is a mechanism when you use the mutex which is a priority inversion which is useful in such case when the thread is waiting on the mutex which is, uh, which is acquired by the other thread. So the other thread could have the, the priority bump, but in our case, there is no mutex here any longer. So if, was, if there was any way to, to, to do something similar without the relying on mutex, that would be helpful. So what we did basically with the spin loops, waiting for, when we need to wait for written, for written or flash reader, <coughs> we basically have two options. We can either use the spin loop in front of the waiting on the event, or we can just avoid using the spin loop at all. So in our test, it turned out that for very low workload, when there is not so many concurrent threads, it makes sense to do the spinning, unfortunately, because uh, if we simply relied on waiting on the condition variable, it took too much time. So uh, the, the TPS was decreased, the threads were uh, wasting their time on waiting on the event and then being wake, uh, woken up. Uh, but for higher workloads where there is a lot of threads, it makes no sense to spin because it's just a wasting of CPU cycles. So what we do, we monitor how much CPU is being used on the server. And I don't, don't like this part, but we didn't come up with anything which could be uh, a better solution here. So if the CPU, if there is a lot of CPU on the server unused, we can uh, afford to do the spinning, but as soon as the CPU is too busy on the server, we avoid to do the spinning. This is what we come up with. Uh, ideally, we would like to not to spin at all or leave so, this so decision not to, to... So what we have in the kernel for similar situation is that, uh, so we do also optimistic spinning on sleeping logs like mutexes and stuff like that. And what we do there is that the first one to that is trying to acquire the mutex records himself as the one who is going to spin. Everyone else just goes to sleep. So if there are follow-up processes that arrive at the same mutex, they see there is already someone spinning, so they just go to sleep, I think. Uh, and so, so, so because like they think that there is like the high contention because they are already second one or even more ones mm -hmm. who are waiting on the mutex, yeah. So, that's what we do and it works reasonably well. So, yeah, yeah, so this, this is kernel internal implementation of a lock, yeah. Nothing, nothing.
well, yeah, but I guess you can, like, you know, P-thread conditional variables and stuff like that is, is this kind of thing, but yeah, you could probably work on improving that, yeah. So, so Wyman has actually, just this afternoon, Wyman has a talk about efficient user space optimistic spinning blocks, yeah. So, so I guess talk to him and, you know, I'm not guy doing this kind of stuff yet. Yeah. But in PTL, they have adaptive mutexes and you have you use them in MySQL. From a long time, we got the pressure to implement uh, different ways because uh, POSIX threads or greens, mutexes or whatever so it was called are more adaptive and so on. So we spend the time to implement framework which allowing you to use any kind of implementation and still homemade implementation is the most efficient one. So we're still using Atomix inside and uh, we, still we have pause instruction and spinning and it's still most efficient, so nothing better. Well, just work on improving what's what's in the libraries. Yeah, Th that's the best I can suggest to you. Like, if you know there are some performance improvements to the locking, then just look how P thread mutex is implemented, and or or talk to people who are implementing that and try to improve what's there, because that that's how open source works. You see, it, it was the same story about, uh, so when uh, this uh, implementation was tested on generic workload, on generic testing, yeah. how mutexes are working, it's always showed better results than what we have in homemade mutexes. So Mark Allegan worked with a lot of this. And once you run real workload with MySQL, this is the opposite story. Ah, I see. Okay, so what we needed was basically a single condition variable for each fragment of the redo log up to which it makes sense to wait for. So for example, let's suppose, suppose we had those user threads. The first user thread wanted to have redo flashed up to this point. The second wanted to have flashed redo up to this point. And those guys wanted to have flashed redo up to some point in this block. So these are consecutive blocks of redo lock, which is a write ahead lock for us. And each of these user threads is doing basically a transaction commit. So each of them is uh, waiting for some LSN up to which the data must be flushed to disk before he can report to the user thread that the, 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 the transaction is safe and committed. So <laughs> because this w if we suppose that spinning was not enough, so they, they probably, uh, or we didn't want to afford spinning at all, so they they would like to wait on the condition variable, p free condition variable. But they cannot simply wait on a single one because it's in such case, if Rido was flushed forward, we would need to wake up all of them so they can notice that hmm, Rido is flushed farther, but it's still not enough for me, for example, so I need to retry waiting on the event. So this is how it works, how it worked in previous MySQL version, the previous InnoDB version. So the change is that we sharded this, we created n bets, and when somebody, is want, somebody wants to wait for LSN flashed up to certain point, he selects the proper bet, and each bet has its own p condition variable. So there is, not a single one on which everybody is doing a wait, and then everybody is woken up, and only few are satisfied, and everybody else needs to go sleep again. But instead of that, if Rido is, let's say, fr uh, flashed from here to here, we wake up guys waiting on this and this event. So these guys still are not being woken up, so they can sleep farther. This way we avoid false wake-ups, uh, unless the, the LSN is progressed somewhere in, band in the middle of the log block, so it's not to the moved to the, f to the end. So in case, for example, data was flashed up to the middle of this block, we would, walk, we would wake up those two guys, and maybe only one of them would be happy, but the other one would still 
weight because he wanted, for example, Rido to be flashed up to this point, which is a farther point. But fortunately, what we do is that whenever we have a complete block to be flushed, we only flush complete blocks. We avoid flushing incomplete block. This is, thank this is uh, possible because of the Rido thread we have in background, which all the time tries to write to file system cache all the complete blocks we have. So if at least a single block of Rido is prepared and complete, we write only complete blocks. So if the last one is incomplete, we just skip it. Then the write is finished. Meanwhile, the incomplete block could become filled in. So again, in the next round, we would just write the complete block. So this way, we try to avoid writing incomplete blocks of the Rido lock. And thanks to that, this mechanism makes sense because if only f complete blocks are being written all the time, the LSN is shifted between the boundaries of the consecutive log blocks and we wake up only those that were really interested in being woken up. So nobody is unhappy because of being woken up. Uh, okay. So the question I have, uh, which I noticed when playing with this uh, stuff around and doing tests. The first of all, uh, could this p 3 con signal broadcast be faster? Uh, is it synchronous, asynchronous? Because it, it, from the perspective of the thread which is doing the notification to wake up other threads, it is not cheap. And we actually had to introduce a special <sighs> readalog thread, which is called notifier thread which only keeps, the only thing it does is keep going through this array, which is a cyclic array, yes? Because, yeah, we, sell, we, we, we have only a fixed number of bets, and it keeps notifying threads when the LSN is progressed. At the first, in the first implementation, it was the read of writer thread. After it finished write, or the log flasher thread, the, the same attempt. After it finished write or flash, it then proceeded with notification. But the time required to do the notification stuff was so significant that because of that, the next write or the next flash was delayed and that overall throughput was much lower. So introducing a special threads which, just, which only do the notification in loop increase these uh, transactions per second, but it sounds a little bit stupid because all we need to do is just schedule a, notifi schedule a w w wake up for some other thread, yes? So my, po my, question, my first question is why is this operation so, so expensive? Is it waiting until this thread in the wait queue is being actually woken up or how is it possible that waking up a single thread is so ex so so expensive from the perspective of the thread which is doing the notification? Could we just have some optimization for that? The the the, the next point is uh, is there any way is there any chance to optimize the wake up execution path and the wait queues in the kernel so this could work much faster because the current performance is very much relied on how effectively we can wake up quickly threads. I think I, something like 50 microseconds is the... Like time to wake up a single thread? No, 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 time to wait, moment, this was time to wait. Uh, but like 10, micros 10 microseconds, something like that could be? Do I come in a single condition variable? Mm -hmm. uh, the next point uh, is, the next question is, how long does, does the pause instruction take? Because we found it can vary. 
and because the, the waiting procedure which we have is basically goes like this. First, we do this spin loop of pause instructions. And now the question is how many iterations should we do? Mm. And I think any fixed value doesn't look proper because it should depend on the architecture. But so for now we have the fixed value. So if we could somehow get the information how long does how long could we expect pause would take on a specific architecture that would be helpful should we just measure it at the startup by ourselves doing some benchmarks i don't know no that doesn't make any sense that's not what pause is for right pause pause is going to depend on what your other thread is doing yeah So how could I know how long should I do the spin loop? Okay, uh, the, the, the other question we have is the single threaded workload. In single threaded workloads, because of shifting work between threads, we don't gain anything. Actually, we have a loss, yes, of the latency we add. So the question is, uh, could we have a kind of, uh, kind of effect that whenever we wanted to wait for some other thread, until it does its job, which is a worker thread which is working in the background, could we have a way to s hint the scheduler that this is the time we would like other job to be done in the other thread? But normally, it yes, normally it would happen in other thread, but for our case, because it is like the single threaded almost scenario, could we just switch to that particular thread and do it right away? So kind of, uh, I don't know, proxy execution was presented during this uh, conference. So uh, it sounded like a possible solution if we could just uh, have this chain of uh, things to be done which normally are executed in concurrent threads to be executed as fast as possible in case when the workload is almost single threaded and this whole architecture is not suited well for these kind of things because otherwise we would need to end up with two implementations. One implementation which is prepared for a case where there is a highly concurrent environment in which case we have these worker threads and a lot of user threads doing things concurrently and the other implementation which is uh, optimized for a single threaded or almost single threaded workloads. So, so essentially what you would like to do is like say I am now running and I now want to give up my time slice and please run this thread instead of me like to do the work like yeah. so we have like kind of producer consumer kind of relationship between threads and like the consumer now wants to give up his time slice to the producer. Yes, yes, yes. So for instance if I was uh, user trans the transaction was being committed in normal case what I do is that I am waiting until some background thread log writer writes and flashes read the log up to disk up to certain point. But because I know that I'm, it's almost single threaded workload, I would like to do it myself because it would be faster because nobody, I would quickly just start the write and have it finished and that way it would be faster than letting no other thread, hey guy, do it for me and then he's wake, woken up for example and he notices, oh, okay, this well, is data. Well if you want to do it in your thread, then you can certainly do, but that's a user space kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, it's doable in user space, but it ends up with an implementation that... Yes, I, I understand. You have to have the basically then comp more complex implementation for yeah. yourself. But then, like, the kernel still has to do the thread switch at least, yes. So there is one thing like a scheduling decision when I give, when I give the time slice to the 
producer and that could be influenced i can imagine i'm not a cpu yeah yeah like like kernel tries to actually infer this co producer consumer relationship in the cpu schedule and tries to follow them but obviously it's a heuristic and doesn't have to work all the time and it doesn't work in quite some use cases mm -hmm. but uh so, so one thing is when do we give the time slice and that could be inferred but then you still have to pay the cost of switching to another thread like you have to reset up the cpu registers you know permission like the protections between the threads because you cannot yeah. just allow two threads to yes but then you end up with a compromise between the complexity in the source code and the effect you get you are in the middle yes yeah, i agree but yes you will be in the middle but it could be a better yeah it could be so so if I we if the opposite way would be just to say no we don't want increased complexity in source code and sorry <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so i so what i wanted to say is i can see like way to hint the scheduler that you know this i want now this process to run i, I can imagine this to happen mm -hmm. but like doing something more complex in the kernel would be kind of difficult if you just have a lock that that process takes and you acquire it that actually works and uh, to wake it up because if yeah. you wait for a lock that's held by another, by another process it will switch directly to that process in the same time slice and we, ha we do that in a bunch of Postgres and it works quite well. Our cost of switching is a bit higher because it's different processes, but other than that, it, most of these transitions work by acquiring a lock that the other process already holds and it um, automatically switches there. So this is the purity inversion, I think, that is working here? Yeah, generally just like there's a, it's not quite full priority inversion, but like generally if you hold a kernel level lock or you try to acquire a kernel level lock that's held by another process, there's a transition to that pro other process oh. in for most lock types. I don't know whether it's all of them. It works for like semaphores. That's what we happen to use. But and we the way we implement them, we have it happens that they're always blocked. So that's why we always switch. But okay. So yeah, but. I will just thank you. I was just thinking if I could use the other. Okay, so this is uh, the end of this part. Um, just to show you the point that Pavel mentioned it, so this uh, this is a historical graph now from Archive, from us, from development. This is with spinning code. So here you see how bigger is difference in performance comparing to the condition way on any other implementation. But of course, when we have do no more CPU cycles, we are going down. So that's why there was a trade-off here in implementation. So a uh, few other points. Uh, so this about thread communication. Uh, next point was about CPU cache story. So in fact, uh, what we're looking for, uh, we discussed it a lot during these three days, uh, especially with Intel guys about, so seems like the only way to understand what happens is to use VTune. So our problem is then uh, we want some people doing QA testing are able to discover faster what happens. So this just give you example what it's a benchmark test with DB stress, okay? So pure read-only workload, one select doing, so it's 
per, well, scaling at least, we have better performance on two CPU socket comparing to one, okay? And you can see what happens, uh, what is reported by perf stat from uh, CPU cache. So there is some <coughs> LLC miss, fine. So well, when we discuss it with guys, so oh, you already have problems here, but here it's scaling. And here it's not scaling at all. So we have worse performance and it's read only. We're only doing reads. And on two CPU socket, we have worse performance. So we know at least why. So okay, for this story, at least we know why. We want to see it reported by CPU, by any other stats, and we can have from CPU uh, cache. Uh, and what happens exactly there is several threads will write and change the same variable inside. So you don't have any cache me, so simple layer statistics. So well, it seems like Vtune will report this. The problem with such kind of tests are running 24 hours and we have 1,000 commits of changes per day. And our QA guys cannot sit down all the day with Vtune and look on this. So we need to have some kind of scriptable solution which can report then we hit this problem. And I'm pretty sure we have tons of such kind of problems because from the past in MySQL code there was many like this. So uh, we probably still have many places which can be improved. So we have some uh, false sharing or something like this. So uh, synchronization between CPU cores, which is blocking and it's not reported. You have no weights, you still use CPU, everything looks fine, but you are going slowly. So if you have some advices, uh, so we're working directly with Intel guys. Brandon, if you have some stuff about this, we'll be happy to script it and and see on this, so I'm pretty sure Netflix has the same story. In fact, any, uh, well, Facebook guys, they have it as well because everything which is multi-thread fits in the same. So, any advice will come. So you, well, we are open to any discussion because this is very painful, especially when simple read-only is not scaling. No advice? Well, I, Long, we got long discussion with Intel guys, so uh, they are also working on their side on this, so they want to show something. So this is CPU side. Now about the network. Uh, in fact, as I told you this morning, so MySQL is just tons of problem on any side. So in fact, on MySQL you can use uh, Unix socket, which is local sonic, and you can use uh, Lubac. So this is a difference between, well, it's not red ones, and this is just, this is about uh, loopback IP port, and this is about Unix socket. So difference can go up to 19 person, and seems like it's directly going from IP stack. So, uh, you know, I initially, well, we saw then, okay, it's on Intel, but we have the same story on ARM, and so it's directly related to Linux kernel only. And if we can improve here something, so it probably can improve, you imagine then 20% better on the network, it's something. So better traffic, probably more efficient and so on. So this is one story about the network. Any ideas here? So what can be different between loopback and, it, in fact, it's the same socket interface, right? Just implementation behind it's different. I can imagine the setting up IP socket, which basically has to follow the whatever IP boundary. It's more difficult than just setting up Linux and in the setting is a like machine level set thing. Very different in ARM and Linux. Yep, Unfor on Solaris, unfortunately, it was even more worse. So at least <laughs> Linux is doing better work on this level, but still. And the Final topic is about backlog. So I don't know if you, so backlog is used, uh, you know, uh, when you listen on IP, IP socket, so you cannot accept all connections which are coming in, coming in batch. So 
you will have backlog just to keep them in queue and not reject, okay? So mainly it will protect you from situation when you have just one switch going down and all network will move to another one. So you have 10,000 users coming back and you have 10,000 connections coming all together. It's very easy to kill the server, you know, it will be just like a DOS attack. So to use the backlog is the only way to keep them in queue so they will not be rejected and users what they do if rejected, right, it will retry, retry, retry and you kill everything. So you can, first you need to configure it on OS level and on MySQL level we also have uh, the option to say uh, how big your backlog will be. So it's when we uh, starting to listen on socket so we use this option. The most common workload what we, what we have from any well, web application and so on, imagine even Facebook it still can do this because they cannot use persistent connections. So you have a lot of context uh, about uh, every user. So it every time it will need connect to database, do some query, it disconnects. So we have massive attack on connect, disconnect. So it's massively connecting, disconnecting and so on. And what's amazing, so if we don't use backlog, we have up, up to 15%, so probably even more better performance. And you know, there is no impact. So in fact, uh, what it's doing, why, how is this, the full impact because uh, users are normal, so the, there is no storm, everything is fine, and well, still about the network. So this is uh, was observed also by QA guys, so they wanted to find the most optimal value and they did not find any difference if you use one or thousand or 10,000, but if you have zero, wow, you have better performance. So we cannot say our users use zero if you need to go faster. Uh, because you still have a risk then uh, if you have a storm of connection, you will die. Uh, but probably there is something to improve because if there is no storm, there will be no difference here. What is doing Netflix? Anything, anything, there is no contention, there is, you know, all is fine. In fact, the main problem before and always was in our code, in our own code. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, in, uh, since uh, the previous version, uh, so from 20,000, we went to 100,000 connections per second and we can do. So it's in our code. Okay. But, well, why backlog is just option on on AP socket, nothing else. Can we include backlog? I mean, we observe it, so what's the point of introducing backlog to see how and when people are using it? I haven't seen setting it to zero and being kind of pretty broken. But me as well, so I just asked the okay, you know, we have no idea to find any kind of value, and one of us <laughs> is zero, and they were surprised as of, is it normal? I said, I don't, probably not at all. So we have started in the past uh, because there are many restrictions. So an Oracle, Oracle taken all security points very critically. And so with SSL, there was some kind of global lock which was limiting globally per system all connections. So you cannot just, when you do connect, it will generate some uh, random ID which you need to use and so on. And, but in this case, nothing like this. So, in, in fact, uh, 
to, to run quicker, uh, it will be Unix socket because um, uh, so everything can be stored. So in fact, there is some limitation hidden on AP socket. If you're going too fast, well, and it's QAS is running locally, so it's uh, so it can be Unix socket. But then they test it on AP as well, and the story is the same. Okay, so well, we will continue to dig. Uh, Brandon pro probably have some ideas. We discussed it about file systems as well, digging. So you have some tools about uh, file system uh, observation. Here about file system, do we have any problem on file systems? Uh, no, no. Because I, I recall you use it MySQL on sometimes. So, yeah, so this is just uh, we discussed it before about XFSX before, and we have different performance totally, and especially better performance on XFS if we do more writes. If you have any tools or comments, or we will be happy to use it. But <gasps> well, just to to finish all these problems articles, so you can find on my blog site, and I also have some tools which helping to analyze. Now, mostly about MySQL. Be before it was about everything. Uh, well, this was. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you everyone today. Um, yeah, thanks to all our speakers and thank you um, participants for lending your knowledge on that and I'm sure there's going to be many more emails to follow up in, in the right way. So um, much appreciate you all for coming and now the important bit, lunch. <laughs>